This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce, Chapter 13, recorded by Bob Foster, Montreal, March 2006. The summer evening had begun to fold the world in its mysterious embrace. Far away in the west the sun was setting, and the last glow of all too fleeting day lingered lovingly on sea and strand, on the proud promontory of dear old Houth, guarding as ever the waters of the bay, on the weed-grown rocks along Sandy Mount shore, and, last but not least, on the quiet church whence there streamed forth at times upon the stillness the voice of prayer to her who is in her pure radiance a beacon ever to the storm-tossed heart of man mary star of the sea the three girlfriends were seated on the rocks enjoying the evening scene and the air which was fresh but not too chilly many a time and oft were they wont to come there to that favourite nook to have a cosy chat beside the sparkling waves and discuss matters feminine Sissy Caffrey and Edie Boardman, with the baby in the push-car, and Tommy and Jackie Caffrey, two little curly-headed boys, dressed in sailor suits with caps to match, and the name H.M.S. Belial printed on both. For Tommy and Jackie Caffrey were twins, scarce four years old, and very noisy, and spoiled twins sometimes, but for all that, darling little fellows with bright merry faces and endearing ways about them. They were dabbling in the sand with their spades and buckets, building castles as children do, or playing with their big colored ball happy as the day was long. And Edie Boardman was rocking the chubby baby to and fro in the push-car, while that young gentleman fairly chuckled with delight. He was but eleven months and nine days old, and, though still a tiny toddler, was just beginning to lisp his first babyish words. Sissy Caffrey bent over him to tease his fat little plucks and the dainty dimple in his chin. "'Now, baby,' Sissy Caffrey said, "'say out big, big, I want a drink of water.' And baby prattled after her, "'A jink, a jink, a jobbo. Sissy Caffrey cuddled the wee chap, for she was awfully fond of children, so patient with little sufferers, and Tommy Caffrey could never be got to take his castor oil unless it was Sissy Caffrey that held his nose, and promised him the scatty heel of the loaf of brown bread with golden syrup on it. What a persuasive power that girl had! But to be sure, baby was as good as gold, a perfect little dote in his new fancy bib. None of your spoilt beauties, Flora Mac Macflimsy sort, was Sissy Caffrey, a true-hearted lass never drew the breath of life, always with a laugh in her gypsy-like eyes and a frolicsome word on her cherry, ripe, red lips, a girl lovable in the extreme, and Edie Boardman laughed, too, at the quaint language of little brother. But just then there was a slight altercation between Master Tommy and Master Jackie. Boys will be boys, and our two twins were no exception to this golden rule. The apple of discord was a certain castle of sand which Master Jackie had built, and Master Tommy would have it right go wrong that it was to be architecturally improved by a front door like the Martello Tower had. But if Master Tommy was headstrong, Master Jackie was self-willed too, and, true to the maxim that every little Irishman's house is his castle, he fell upon his hated rival and to such purpose that the would-be assailant came to grief and, alas to relate, the coveted castle too. Needless to say, the cries of discomfited Master Tommy drew the attention of the girlfriends. "'Come here, Tommy,' his sister called imperatively, "'at once, and you, Jackie, for shame, to throw poor Tommy in the dirty sand. Wait till I catch you for that.' His eyes misty with unshed tears, Master Tommy came at her call for their big sister's word was law with the twins, and in a sad plight he was after his misadventure. His little man-o'-war 
top and unmentionables were full of sand but Sissy was a past mistress in the art of smoothing over life's tiny troubles and very quickly not one speck of sand was to be seen on his smart little suit still the blue eyes were glistening with hot tears that would well up so she kissed away the hurtness and shook her hand at master jacky the culprit and said if she was near him she wouldn't be far from him her eyes dancing in admonition nasty bull jacky she cried she put an arm round the little mariner and coaxed winningly what's your name butter and cream tell us who is your sweetheart spoke edie boardman is sissy your sweetheart now tearful tommy said is edie boardman your sweetheart sissy queried no tommy said i know edie boardman said none too amiably with an arch glance from her short-sighted eyes i know who is tommy's sweetheart gertie is tommy's sweetheart no tommy said on the verge of tears sissy's quick mother wit guessed what was amiss and she whispered to edie boardman to take him there behind the push-car where the gentleman couldn't see and to mind he didn't wet his new tan shoes but who was gertie gertie mcdowell who was seated near her companions lost in thought gazing far away into the distance was in very truth as fair a specimen specimen of winsome irish girlhood as one could wish to see she was pronounced beautiful by all who knew her though as folks often said she was more a gilt trap than a mcdowell her figure was slight and graceful inclining even to fragility but those iron jelloids she had been taking of late had done her a world of good much better than the widow welch's female pills and she was much better of those discharges she used to get and that tired feeling the waxen pallor of her face was almost spiritual in its ivory-like purity though her rosebud mouth was a genuine cupid's bow greekly perfect her hands were of finely veined alabaster with tapering fingers and as white as lemon juice and queen of ointments could make them though it was not true that she used to wear kid gloves in bed or take a milk foot bath either bertha supple told that once told that once to edie boardman a deliberate lie when she was black out at dacker's drawn with gertie the girl chums had of course their little tiffs from time to time like the rest of mortals and she told her not let on whatever she did that it was her that told her or she'd never speak to her again no honour where honour is due there was an innate refinement a languid queenly hauteur about gertie which was unmistakably evidenced in her delicate hands and high arched instep had kind fate but willed her to be born a gentlewoman of high degree in her own right and had she only received the benefit of a good education gertie mcdowell might easily have held her own beside any lady in the land and have seen herself exquisitely gowned with jewels on her brow and patrician suitors at her feet vying with one another to pay their devoirs to her mayhap it was this the love that might have been that lent to her softly featured face at whiles a look tense with suppressed meaning that imparted a strange yearning tendency to the beautiful eyes a charm few could resist why have women such eyes of witchery gertie's were of the bluest irish blue set off by lustrous lashes and dark expressive brows time was when those brows were not so silkily seductive it was madame vera verity directress of the woman beautiful page of the princess novelette who had first advised her to try eyebrow, eyebrow line which gave that haunting expression to the eyes so becoming in leaders of fashion and she had never regretted it then there was blushing scientifically cured and how to be tall increase your height and you have a beautiful face but your nose that would suit mrs dignam because she had a button one but gertie's crowning glory was her wealth of wonderful hair it was dark brown with a natural wave in it 
She had cut it that very morning on account of the new moon and it nestled about her pretty head in a profusion of luxuriant clusters and pared her nails too, Thursday for wealth. And just now at Edie's words as a telltale flush, delicate as the faintest rose-bloom, crept into her cheeks she looked so lovely in her sweet girlish shyness that of a surety God's fair land of Ireland did not hold her equal. For an instant she was silent with rather sad downcast eyes. She was about to retort, but something checked the words on her tongue. Inclination prompted her to speak out. Dignity told her to be silent. The pretty lips pouted a while, but then she glanced up and broke out into a joyous little laugh, which had in it all the freshness of a young May morning. She knew right well, no one better, what made Squinty Edie say that because of him cooling in his attentions when it was simply a lover's quarrel? As per usual, somebody's nose was out of joint about the boy that had the bicycle always riding up and down in front of her window. Only now his father kept him in the evening studying hard to get an exhibition in the intermediate that was on and he was going to Trinity College to study for a doctor when he left the high school like his brother W. E. Wiley who was racing in the bicycle races in the Trinity College University. Little wrecked he perhaps for what she felt, that dull aching void in her heart sometimes, piercing to the core, yet he was young and perchance he might learn to love her in time. They were Protestants in his family and of course Gertie knew who came first and after him the Blessed Virgin and then St. Joseph but he was undeniably handsome, with an exquisite nose, and he was what he looked, every inch a gentleman, the shape of his head, too, at the back, without his cap on, that she would know anywhere something off the common, and the way he turned the bicycle at the lamp with his hands off the bars, and also the nice perfume of those good cigarettes, and besides they were both of a size, and that was why Edie Boardman thought she was so frightfully clever, because he didn't go and ride up and down in front of her bit of a garden. Gertie was dressed simply, but with the instinctive taste of a votary of dame fashion, for she felt that there was just a mite that he might be out. A neat blouse of electric blue, self-tinted by dolly dyes, because it was expected in the ladies' pictorial that electric blue would be worn, with a smart V opening down to the, to the division, and kerchief pocket, in which she always kept a piece of cotton wool scented with her favorite perfume, because the handkerchief spoiled the sit. And a navy three-quarter skirt cut to the stride showed off her slim, graceful figure to perfection. She wore a coquettish little love of a hat, of wide-leaved nigger straw contrast, trimmed with an underbrim of egg-blue chenille and at the side a butterfly bow to tone. All Tuesday week afternoon she was hunting to match that chenille, but at last she found what she wanted at Clary's summer sales. The very it, slightly shop-soiled, but you would never notice seven fingers, two, and a penny. She did it up all by herself, and what joy was hers when she tried it on then, smiling at the lively reflection which the mirror gave back to her, <clears throat> and when she put it on the water jug to keep the shape, she knew that that would take the shine out of some people she knew. Her shoes were the newest thing in footwear. Edie Boardman prided herself that she was very petite, but she never had a foot like Gertie McDowell, a five, and never would ash, oak, or elm. With patent toe caps and just one smart buckle at her high-arched instep, her well-turned ankle displayed its perfect proportions beneath her skirt, and just the proper amount, and no more, of her shapely limbs encased in fine-spun hose, with high spliced heels and wide garter tops. As for undies, they were Gertie's chief care, and who that knows the fluttering hopes and fears of sweet seventeen, though Gertie would never see seventeen again, can find it in his heart to blame her. She had four dinky sets with awfully pretty stitchery, three garments and nighties extra, 
each set slotted with different coloured ribbons, rose pink, pale blue, mauve and pea green, and she aired them herself and blued them when they came home from the wash and ironed them, and she had a brick bat to keep the iron on because she wouldn't trust those washerwomen as far as she'd see them scorching the things. She was wearing the blue for luck, hoping against hope, her own colour, and the lucky colour too for a bride to have a bit of blue somewhere on her because the green she wore that day week brought grief because his father brought him into study for the intermediate exhibition and because she thought perhaps he might be out because when she was dressing that morning she nearly slipped up the old pear on her inside out and that was for luck and lovers meetings if you put those things on inside out so long as it wasn't of a friday and yet and yet that strained look on her face a gnawing sorrow is there all the time her very soul is in her eyes and she would give worlds to be in the privacy of her own familiar chamber where giving way to tears she could have a good cry and relieve her pent-up feelings though not too much because she knew how to cry nicely before the mirror you are lovely gertie it said the paley light of evening falls upon a face infinitely sad and wistful. Gertie MacDowell yearns in vain. Yes, she had known from the first that her daydream of a marriage has been arranged, and the wedding bells ringing for Mrs. Reggie Wiley, T.C.D., because the one who married the elder brother would be Mrs. Wiley. And in the fashionable intelligence, Mrs. Gertrude Wiley was wearing a sumptuous confection of grey trimmed with expensive blue fox was not to be he was too young to understand he would not believe in love a woman's birthright the night of the party long ago in stores he was still in short trousers when they were alone and he stole an arm round her waist she went white to the very lips he called her little one in a strangely husky voice and snatched a half kiss the first but it was only the end of her nose and then he hastened from the room with a remark about refreshments. Impetuous fellow! Strength of character had never been Reggie Wiley's strong point, and he who would woo and win Gertie MacDowell must be a man among men. But waiting, always waiting to be asked, and it was leap year too, and would soon be over. No Prince Charming is her beau ideal to lay a rare and wondrous love at her feet, but rather a manly man with a strong, quiet face who had not found his ideal, perhaps his hair slightly flecked with grey, and who would understand, take her in his sheltering arms, strain her to him, and all the strength of his deep, passionate nature, and comfort her with a long, long kiss. It would be like heaven. For such a one she yearns this balmy summer eve, with all the heart of her she longs to be his only, his affianced bride for riches for poor and sickness and health till death us to part from this to this day forward and while edie Bro and while edie boardman and while edie boardman was with little tommy behind the push car she was just thinking would the day ever come when she would call herself his little wife to be then they could talk about her till they went blue in the face, Bertha Supple too, and Edie, the Spitfire, because she would be twenty-two in November. She would care for him with creature comforts too, for Gertie was womanly wise, and knew that a mere man liked that feeling of hominess. Her griddle cakes done to a golden brown hue, and Queen Anne's pudding of delightful creaminess, had won golden opinions from all, because she had a lucky hand also for lighting a fire, a dredge in the fine self-raising flour, and always stir in the same direction, then cream the milk and sugar and whisk well the white of eggs, though she didn't like the eating part when there were any people that made her shy, and often she wondered why you couldn't eat something poetical like violets or roses, and they would have a beautifully appointed drawing-room with pictures and engravings and the photograph of Grandpa Giltrap's lovely dog, Gary Owen, that almost talked, it was so human, and chintz covers for the chairs, and that silver toast rack in Clary's summer jumble sales like they have in rich houses. 
He would be tall with broad shoulders she had always admired tall men for a husband with glistening white teeth under his carefully trimmed sweeping moustache and they would go on the continent for their honeymoon three wonderful weeks and then when they settled down in a nice snug and cosy little homely house every morning they would both have brekkie simple but perfectly served for their own two selves and before he went out to business he would give his dear little wifey a good hearty hug and gaze for a moment deep down into her eyes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Ulysses by James Joyce, Chapter 13, Part 2, recorded by Bob Foster, Montreal, March 2006. Edie Boardman asked Tommy Caffrey was he done, and he said yes. So then she buttoned up his little knickerbockers for him and told him to run off and play with Jackie and to be good now and not to fight. But Tommy said he wanted the ball, and Edie told him no, that Baby was playing with the ball, and if he took it there'd be wigs on the green, but Tommy said it was his ball, and he wanted his ball, and he pranced on the ground, if you please. The temper of him. Oh, he was a man already, was little Tommy Caffrey, since he was out of pennies. Edie told him no, no, and to be off now with him, and she told Sissy Caffrey not to give in to him. "'You're not my sister,' naughty Tommy said. "'It's my ball.' But Sissy Caffrey told Baby Boardman to look up, look up high at her finger, and she snatched the ball quickly and threw it along the sand, and Tommy after it in full career, having won the day. "'Anything for a quiet life,' laughed Sis. And she tickled Tiny Tot's two cheeks to make him forget, and played, Here is the Lord Mayor, here is his two horses, here is his gingerbread carriage, and here he walks in, chin chopper, chin chopper, chin chopper, chin. But Edie got as cross as two sticks about him getting his own way like that from everyone always petting him. I'd like to give him something, she said, so I would, where I won't say. On the bee toady Tom, laughed Sissy merrily. Gertie McDowell bent down her head and crimsoned at the idea of Sissy saying an unladylike thing like that out loud she'd be ashamed of her life to say, flashing a deep rosy red, and Edie Boardman said she was sure the gentleman opposite heard what she said, but not a pen cared Sis. "'Let him,' she said with a pert toss of her head and a piquant tilt of her nose. "'Give it to him, too, on the same place as quick as I'd look at him.' Madcap Sis with her gollywog curls. You had to laugh at her sometimes. For instance, when she asked you, would you have some more Chinese tea and jazzberry ram? And when she drew the jugs too and the men's faces on her nails with red ink, make you split your sides, or when she wanted to go where you know, she said she wanted to run and pay a visit to the Miss White. That was just like Sissy comes. Oh, and will you ever forget the evening she dressed up in her father's suit and hat and the burnt cork moustache and walked down Tritonville Road smoking a cigarette? There was none to come up to her for fun, but she was sincerity itself, one of the bravest and truest hearts heaven ever made, not one of your two-faced things too sweet to be wholesome. And then there came out upon the air the sound of voices and the pealing anthem of the organ. It was the men's temperance retreat conducted by the missioner, the Reverend John Hughes, S.J., Rosary, Sermon, and Benediction of the Most Blessed Sacrament. They were there gathered together without distinction of social class, and a most edifying spectacle it was to see in that simple fane beside the waves after the storms of this weary world kneeling before the feet of the immaculate reciting the litany of our lady of loretto beseeching her to intercede for them the old familiar words holy mary holy virgin of virgins how sad to poor gertie's ears had her father only avoided the clutches of the demon drink by taking the pledge or those powders the drink habit cured in pearson's weekly she might now be rolling in her carriage second to none 
Over and over had she told herself that as she mused by the dying embers in a brown study without the lamp, because she hated two lights or oftentimes gazing out of the window dreamily by the hour at the rain falling on the rusty bucket, thinking. But that vile decoction which has ruined so many hearths and homes had cast its shadow over her childhood days, nay she had even witnessed in the home circle deeds of violence caused by intemperance, and had seen her own father, a prey to the fumes of intoxication, forget himself completely, for if there was one thing of all things that Gertie knew it was the man who lifts his hand to a woman, save in the way of kindness, deserves to be branded as the lowest of the low. And still the voices sang in supplication to the Virgin Most Powerful, Virgin Most Merciful, and Gertie, wrapped in thought, scarce saw or heard her companions, or the twins at their boyish gambols, or the gentleman off Sandy Mount Green that Sissy Caffrey called the man that was so like himself passing along the strand, taking a short walk. You never saw him anyway screwed, but still, and for all that she would not like him for a father because he was too old or something, or on account of his face, it was a palpable case of Dr. Fell, or his carbuncly nose with the pimples on it and his sandy moustache a bit white under his nose. Poor father, with all his faults, she loved him still when he sang, Tell me, Mary, how to woo thee, or my love in cottage near Rochelle. And they had stewed cockles and lettuce with Lazenby's salad dressing for supper, and when he sang The Moon Hath Raised, with Mr. Dignam, that died suddenly, and was buried, God have mercy on him, from a stroke. Her mother's birthday, that was, and Charlie was home on his holidays, and Tom and Mr. Dignam, and Mrs. and Patsy and Freddie Dignam, and they were to have had a group taken. No one would have thought the end was so near. Now he was laid to rest." and her mother said to him to let that be a warning to him for the rest of his days, and he couldn't even go to the funeral on account of the gout, and she had to go into town to bring him the letters and samples from his office about Catesby's cork lino, artistic standard designs, fit for a palace, gives tip-top wear, and always bright and cheery in the home. A sterling good daughter was Gertie, just like a second mother in the house, a ministering angel, too, with a little heart worth its weight in gold. And when her mother had those raging splitting headaches, who was it rubbed on the menthol cone on her forehead but, but Gertie, though she didn't like her mother taking pinches of snuff, and that was the only single thing they ever had words about, taking snuff, everyone thought the world of her for her gentle ways. It was Gertie who turned off the gas at the main every night, and it was Gertie who tacked up on the wall of that place where she never forgot every fortnight the chlorate of lime, Mr. Tooney, the grocer's Christmas almanac, the picture of halcyon days where a young gentleman in the costume they used to wear then, with a three-cornered hat, was offered a bunch of flowers to his lady-love with old-time chivalry through her lattice window. You could see there was a story behind it. The colors were done something lovely. She was in a soft, clinging white and a studied attitude, and the gentleman was in chocolate, and he looked a thorough aristocrat. She often looked at them dreamily, when there for a certain purpose, and felt her own arms that were white and soft just like hers, with the sleeves back, and thought about those times, because she had found out in Walker's pronouncing dictionary that belonged to Grandpa Giltrap about the halcyon days, what they meant. The twins were now playing in the most approved brotherly fashion, till at last Master Jackie, who was really as bold as brass, there was no getting behind that deliberately kicked the ball as hard as ever he could down towards the seaweedy rocks. Needless to say, poor Tommy was not slow to voice his dismay, but luckily the gentleman in black who was sitting there by himself came gallantly to the rescue, and intercepted the ball. Our two champions claimed their plaything with lusty cries, and to avoid trouble, Sissy Caffrey called to the gentleman to throw it to her please. The gentleman aimed the ball once or twice, and then threw it up the strand towards Sissy Caffrey, but it rolled down the slope and stopped right under Gertie's skirt, near the little pool by the rock. The twins clamored again for it, and Sissy told her to kick it away and let them fight for it, so Gertie threw back her foot, 
but she wished their stupid ball hadn't come rolling down to her and she gave a kick but she missed and Edie and Sissy laughed. If you fail, try again, Edie Boardman said. Gertie smiled assent and bit her lip. A delicate pink crept into her pretty cheek but she was determined to let them see so she lifted her skirt a little but just enough and took good aim and gave the ball a jolly good kick and it went over ever so far and the two twins after it down towards the shingle. Pure jealousy of course it was nothing else to draw attention on account of the gentleman up opposite looking. She felt the warm flush a danger signal always with Gertie McDowell surging and flaming into her cheeks. Till then they had only exchanged glances of the most casual, but now under the brim of her new hat she ventured a look at him, and the face that met her gaze there in the twilight, wan and strangely drawn, seemed to her the saddest she had ever seen. Through the open window of the church the fragment incense was wafted, and with it the fragrant names of her who was conceived without stain of original sin, spiritual vessel, pray for us, honorable vessel, pray for us, vessel of singular devotion, pray for us, mystical rose. And careworn hearts were there, and toilers for their daily bread, and many who had erred and wandered, their eyes wet with contrition, but for all that bright with hope for the Reverend Father Hughes had told them what the great St. Bernard said in his famous prayer of Mary, the most pious virgin's intercessory power that it was not recorded in any age that those who implored her powerful protection were ever abandoned by her. The twins were now playing again, right merrily, for the troubles of childhood are but as fleeting summer showers. Sissy played with baby Boardman till he crowed with glee, clapping baby hands in air. Peep, she cried behind the hood of the push-car, and Edie asked where was Sissy gone, and then Sissy popped up her head and cried, Ah! And my word, didn't the little chap enjoy that? And then she told him to say, Papa. Say, Papa, baby. Say, pa, 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 pa. And Baby did his level best to say it, for he was very intelligent for eleven months, everyone said, and big for his age in the picture of health, a perfect little bunch of love, and he would certainly turn out to be something great, they said. Hadja, ja, ja, hadja. Sissy wiped his little mouth with the dribbling bib and wanted him to sit up properly and say, pa, 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 but when she undid the strap, she cried out, holy St. Dennis, that he was passing wet, and to double the half-blanket the other way under him. Of course his infant majesty was most obstreperous at such toilet formalities, and he let everyone know it. Ha, ba, 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 and two great big lovely big tears, tears coursing down his cheeks. It was all no use soothering him with no, 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 baby, no, and telling him about the G-G and where was the puff-puff, but Sis, always ready-witted, gave him in his mouth the teat of the sucking-bottle, and the young heathen was quickly appeased. Gertie wished to goodness they would take their squalling baby home out of that and not get on her nerves no hour to be out in the little brats of twins she gazed out towards the distant sea it was like the paintings that man used to do on the pavement with all the colored chalks and such a pity too leaving them there to be all blotted out the evening and the clouds coming out and the bailey light on howth and to hear the music like that and the perfume of those incense they burned in the church like a kind of waft. And while she gazed her she gazed, her heart went pit pat. Yes, it was her he was looking at, and there was meaning in his look. His eyes burned into her as though they would search her through and through, read her very soul. Wonderful eyes they were superbly expressive, but could you trust them? People were so queer. She could see at once by his his dark eyes and his pale intellectual face that he was a foreigner, the image of the photo she had of Martin Harvey, the matinee idol, only for the mustache, which she preferred because she wasn't stage-struck like Winnie Rippingham that wanted 
they two to always dress the same on account of a play, but she could not see whether he had an aquiline nose or a slightly retroussé from where he was sitting. He was in deep mourning, she could see that, and the story of a haunting sorrow was written on his face. She would have given worlds to know what it was. He was looking up so intently, so still, and he saw her kick the ball, and perhaps he could see the bright steel buckles of her shoes if she swung them like that thoughtfully with the toes down. She was glad that something told her to put on the transparent stockings, thinking Reggie Wiley might be out, but that was far away. Here was that of which she had so often dreamed. It was he who mattered, and there was joy on her face because she wanted him because she felt instinctively that he was like no one else. The very heart of the girl woman went out to him, her dream husband, because she knew on the instant it was him. If he had suffered more sinned against than sinning, or even, even if he had been himself a sinner, a wicked man, she cared not. Even if he was a Protestant or Methodist, she could convert him easily if he truly loved her. There were wounds that wanted healing with heart balm. She was a womanly woman, not like other flighty girls, unfeminine, he had known, those cyclists showing off what they hadn't got, and she just yearned to know all, to forgive all, if she could make him fall in love with her, make him forget the memory of the past. Then mayhap he would embrace her gently like a real man, crushing her soft body to him, and love her, his ownest girly, for herself alone. Refuge of sinners, comfortress of the afflicted, ora pro nobis. Well, has it been said that whosoever prays to her with faith and constancy can never be lost or cast away, and fitly is she too a haven of refuge for the afflicted because of the seven of the seven dolors which transpierced her own heart. Gertie could picture the whole scene in the church, the stained-glass windows lighted up, the candles, the flowers, and the blue banners of the Blessed Virgin's sodality, and Father Conroy was helping Canon O'Hanlon at the altar, carrying things in and out with his eyes cast down. He looked almost a saint, and his confession box was so quiet and clean and dark, and his hands were just like white wax, and if ever she became a Dominican nun in their white habit, perhaps he might come to the convent for the novena of St. Dominic. He told her that time when she told him about that, in confession crimsoning up to the roots of her hair, for fear he could see, not to be troubled, because that was only the voice of nature, and we were all subject to nature's laws, he said, in this life, and that that was no sin, because that came from the nature of woman instituted by God, he said, and that our blessed lady herself said to the archangel, Gabriel, be it done unto me according to thy word. He was so kind and holy, and often, and often she thought, and thought, could she work a ruched tea cosy with embroidered floral design for him as a present or a clock but they had a clock she noticed on the mantelpiece white and gold with a canary bird that came out of a little house to tell the time the day she went there about the flowers for the forty hours adoration because it was hard to know what sort of a present to give or perhaps an album of illuminated views of dublin or some place the exasperating little brats of twins began to quarrel again, and Jackie threw the ball out towards the sea, and they both ran after it, little monkeys common as ditch-water. Someone ought to take them and give them a good hiding for themselves to keep them in their places, the both of them, and Sissy and Edie shouted after them to come back because they were afraid the tide might come in on them and be drowned. Jackie! Tommy! Not they! What a great notion they had! So Sissy said it was the very last time she'd ever bring them out. She jumped up and called them, and she ran down the slope past them, tossing past him, tossing her hair behind her, which had a good enough color if there had been more of it, but with all the thing of she was always rubbing into it. She couldn't get it to grow long because it wasn't natural, so she could just go and throw her hat at it. She ran with long gandry strides, it was a wonder she didn't rip up her skirt at the side that was too tight on her, because there was a lot of the tomboy about Sissy Caffrey, and she was a forward piece whenever she thought she had a good opportunity to show off, and just because she was a good runner she ran like that 
so that he could see all the end of her petticoat running and her skinny shanks up as far as possible. It would have served her just right if she had tripped up over something accidentally on purpose with her high crooked French heels on her to make her look tall and got a fine tumble. Tableau! That would have been a very charming expose for a gentleman like that to witness. Queen of angels, queen of patriarchs, queen of prophets, of all saints, they prayed, queen of the most holy rosary, and then Father Conroy handed the thurible to Canon Hanlon, and he put in the incense, and since the blessed sacrament and Sissy Caffrey caught the two twins, and she was itching to give them a ringing good clip on the ear, but she didn't because she thought he might be watching, but she never made a bigger mistake in all her life, because Gertie could see without looking that he never took his eyes off of her, and then Canon O'Hanlon handed the thurible back to Father Conroy, and knelt down looking up at the blessed sacrament, and the choir began to sing Tantum Ergo, and she just swung her foot in and out in time as the music rose and fell to the Tantumer Gosa Cramen Tum. Three and eleven she paid for those stockings in Sparrows of George's Street on the Tuesday, no, the Monday before Easter, and there wasn't a brack on them, and that was what he was looking at, transparent, and not at her insignificant ones that had neither shape nor form, the cheek of her, because he had eyes in his head to see the difference for himself. Sissy came up along the strand with the two twins and their ball with her hat anyhow on her to one side after her run, and she did look a streel tugging the two kids along with the flimsy blouse she bought only a fortnight before, like a rag on her back, and bit of her petticoat hanging like a caricature. Gertie just took off her hat for a moment to settle her hair and a prettier, daintier head of nut-brown tresses was never seen on a girl's shoulders, a radiant little vision, in sooth, almost maddening in its sweetness. You would have to travel many a long mile before you found a head of hair the like of that. She could also see the swift answering flush of admiration in his eyes that set her tingling in every nerve. She put on her hat so that she could see from underneath the brim and swung her buckled shoe faster for her breath, caught as she caught the expression in his eyes. He was eyeing her as a snake eyes its prey. Her woman's instinct told her that she had raised the devil in him, and at the thought a burning scarlet swept from throat to brow till the lovely color of her face became a glorious rose. Edie Boardman was noticing it, too, because she was squinting at Gertie, half-smiling with her specks, like an old maid pretending to nurse the baby. Irritable little gnat she was, and always would be, and that was why no one could get on with her, poking her nose into what was no concern of hers, and she said to Gertie, a penny for your thoughts. What? replied Gertie, with a smile, reinforced by the whitest of teeth. I was only wondering, was it late? Because she wished goodness they'd take the snotty-nosed twins and their baby home to the mischief out of that so that was why she just gave a, a gentle hint about its being late. And when Sissy came up, Edie asked her the time, and Miss Sissy, as glib as you like, said it was half-past kissing time, time to kiss again. But Edie wanted to know, because they were told to be in early. Wait, said Sissy, I'll ask my Uncle Peter over there what's the time by his conundrum. So over she went, and when he saw her coming, she could see him take his hand out of his pocket, getting nervous and beginning to play with his watch-chain, looking at the church. Passionate nature though he was, Gertie could see that he had enormous control over himself. One moment he had been there, fascinated by a loveliness that made him gaze, and the next moment it was the quiet, grave-faced gentleman, self-control expressed in every line of his distinguished-looking figure. Sissy said to excuse her, would he mind telling her what was the right time, and Gertie could see him taking out his watch, listening to it, and looking up and clearing his throat, and he said he was very sorry his watch was stopped, but he thought it must be after eight because the sun was set. His voice had a cultured ring in it, and though he spoke in measured accents, there was a suspicion of a quiver in the mellow tones. Sissy said thanks, and came back with her tongue out, and said uncle said his waterworks were out of order. 
Then they sang the second verse of the Tantum Ergo, and Canon O'Hanlon got up again and sensed the Blessed Sacrament, and knelt down, and he told Father Conroy that one of the candles was just going to set fire to the flowers, and Father Conroy got up and settled it all right, and she could see the gentleman winding his watch and listening to the works, and she swung her leg more in and out in time. It was getting darker, but he could see and he was looking all the time that he was winding the watch or whatever he was doing to it and then he put it back and put his hands back into his pockets she felt a kind of sensation rushing all over her and she knew by the feel of her scalp and that irritation against her stray her stays that that thing must be coming on because the last time too was when she clipped her hair on account of the moon his dark eyes fixed themselves on her, again drinking in her every contour, literally worship, worshipping at her shrine. If ever there was undisguised admiration in a man's passionate gaze, it was there, plain to be seen on that man's face. It is for you, Gertrude MacDowell, and you know it. Edie began to get ready to go, and it was high time for her, and Gertie noticed that that little hint she gave had the desired effect because it was a long way along the strand to where there was the place to push up the push-car, and Sissy took off the twins' caps and tidied their hair, to make herself attractive, of course, and Canon O'Hanlon stood up, with his cope poking up his neck, and Father Comroy handed him the card to read off, and he read out Panem de Cello Prestiati Ais, and Edie and Sissy were talking about the time all the time, and asking her, but Gertie could pay them back in their own coin, and she just answered with scathing politeness when Edie asked her, was she heartbroken about her best boy throwing her over? Gertie winced sharply. A brief cold blaze shone from her eyes that spoke volumes of scorn immeasurable. It hurt. Oh, yes, it cut deep, because Edie had her own quiet way of saying things like that she knew would wound, like the confounded little cat she was. Gertie's lips parted swiftly to frame the word, but she fought back the sob that rose to her throat, so slim, so flawless, so beautifully moulded, it seemed one an artist might have dreamed of. She had loved him better than he knew light-hearted deceiver and fickle like all his sex he would never understand what he had meant to her and for an instant there was in the blue eyes a quick stinging of tears their eyes were probing her mercilessly but with a brave effort she sparkled back in sympathy as she glanced at her new conquest for them to see oh responded gertie quick as lightning laughing and the proud head flashed up i can throw my cap at who i like because it's leap year her words rang out crystal clear more musical than the cooing of the ring dove but they cut the silence icily there was that in her young voice that told that she was not a one to be lightly trifled with as for mr reggie with his swank and his bit of money she could just chuck him aside as if he was so much filth and never again would she cast as much as a second thought on him and tear his silly postcard into a dozen pieces and if ever after he dared to presume she could give him one look of measured scorn that would make him shrivel up on the spot miss puny little edie's countenance fell to no slight extent and gertie could see by her looking as black as thunder that she was simply in a towering rage though she hit it the little kinnat because that shaft had struck home for her petty jealousy and they both knew that she was something aloof apart in another sphere that she was not of them and there was somebody else too that knew it and saw it so they would so they could put that in their pipe and smoke it. Edie straightened up Baby Boardman to get ready to go, and Sissy tucked in the ball and the spades and buckets, and it was high time, too, because the Sandman was on his way for Master Boardman, Junior, and Sissy told him, too, that Billy Winks was coming, and that Baby was to go dee-daw, and Baby looked just too ducky, laughing up out of his gleeful eyes, and Sissy poked him like that out of fun in his wee fat tummy and Baby without as much as by your leave sent up his compliments on his brand-new dribbling bib oh my puddin'y pie protested sis he has his bib destroyed 
The slight contretemps claimed her attention, but in two twos she set that little matter to rights. Gerty stifled a smothered exclamation and gave a nervous cough, and Edie asked what, and she was just going to tell her to catch it while it was flying, but she was ever ladylike in her deportment, so she simply passed it off with consummate tact by saying that that was the benediction, because just then the bell rang out from the steeple over the quiet seashore, because Canon O'Hanlon was up on the altar with the veil that Father Conroy put round him, his shoulders, round his shoulders, giving the benediction with the blessed sacrament in his hands. How moving the scene there, in the gathering twilight, the last glimpse of Aaron, the touching chime of those evening bells, and at the same time a bat flew forth from the ivied belfry through the dusk, hither, thither, with a tiny lost cry, and she could see far away the lights of the lighthouses, so picturesque she would have loved to do with a box of paints, because it was easier than to make a man, and soon the lamplighter would be going his rounds past the Presbyterian church grounds and along by shady Trittonville Avenue, where the couples walked, and lighting the lamp near her window was Reggie Wiley, used to turn his free wheel like she read in that book, The Lamplighter by Miss Cummins, author of Mabel Vaughan and other tales. For Gertie had her dreams that no one knew of. She loved to read poetry, and when she got a keepsake from Bertha Supple of that lovely confession album with the coral pink cover to write her thoughts in, she laid it in the drawer of her toilet table, which, though it did not err on the side of luxury, was scrupulously neat and clean. It was there she kept her girlish treasures, trove, the tortoiseshell combs, her child of Mary badge, the white rose scent, the eyebrow line, her alabaster pouncet box and the ribbons to change when her things came home from the wash, and there were some beautiful thoughts written in it in violet ink that she bought in Healy's of Dame Street, for she felt that she too could write poetry if she could only express herself like that poem that appealed to her so deeply that she had copied out of the newspaper she found one evening round the pot herbs. Art thou real, my ideal? It was called by Louis J. Walsh, Magerfelt, and after there was something about twilight, wilt thou ever? And oft-times the beauty of poetry, so sad in its transient loveliness, had misted her eyes with silent tears that the ears were slipping by for her one by one, and but for that one shortcoming she knew she need fear no competition, and that was an accident coming down Dalky Hill, and she always tried to conceal it. But it must end, she felt. If she saw that magic lure in his eyes, there would be no holding back her, for her. Love laughs at locksmiths. She would make the great sacrifice. Her every effort would be to share his thoughts. Dearer than the whole world would she be to him and gild his days with happiness. There was the all-important question, and she was dying to know, was he a married man or a widower who had lost his wife, or some tragedy like the nobleman with the foreign name from the land of, of song had to have her put into a madhouse, cruel only to be kind? But even if, what then? Would it make a very great difference? From everything in the least indelicate her fine-bred nature instinctively recoiled, she loathed that sort of person, the fallen woman off the accommodation walk beside the daughter that went with the soldiers and coarse men with no respect for a girl's honour, degrading the sex and being taken up to the police station. No, no, not that. That would be just good friends like a big brother and sister without all that other in spite of the conventions of society with a big S. Perhaps it was an old flame he was in mourning for from the days beyond recall. She thought she understood. She would try to understand it because men were so different. The old love was waiting, waiting with little white hands stretched out with blue appealing eyes. Heart of mine, she would follow her dream of love, the dictates of her heart, that told her he was her all in all, the only man in all the world for her, for love was the master guide. Nothing else mattered. Come what might, she would be wild, untrammeled, free. And that's the end of Chapter 13, Part 2 of James Joyce's Ulysses. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce. Chapter 13, Part 3. Recorded by Bob Foster. Montreal, March 2006. Canon O'Hanlon put the Blessed Sacrament back into the tabernacle, and the choir sang Laudate Dominum Omnis Gentes, and then he locked the tabernacle door because the benediction was over, and Father Conroy handed him his hat to put on, and Cross Cat Edie asked, wasn't she coming, but Jackie Caffrey called out, Oh, look, sissy! And they all looked, was it sheet lightning, but Tommy saw it too over the trees beside the church, blue and then green and purple. It's fireworks, Sissy Caffrey said. And they all ran down the strand to see over the houses and the church, helter-skelter, Edie with the pushcar with baby boardman in it, and Sissy holding Tommy and Jackie by the hand so they wouldn't fall running. Come on, Gertie, Sissy called. It's the bizarre fireworks. But Gertie was adamant. She had no intention of being at their beck and call. If they could run like Rosie's, she could sit so she said she could see from where she was. The eyes that were fastened upon her set her pulses tingling. She looked at him a moment, meeting his glance, and a late broke in upon her. White-hot passion was in that face, passion silent as the grave, and it had made her his. At last they were left alone without the others to pry and pass remarks, and she knew he could be trusted to the death. Steadfast, a sterling man, a man of inflexible honor to his fingertips. His hands and face were working, and a tremor went over her. She leaned back far to look up where the fireworks were, and she caught her knee in her hand so as not to fall back looking up, and there was no one to see only him and her, when she revealed all her graceful, beautifully shaped legs like that, supply soft and delicately rounded, and she seemed to hear the panting of his heart, his hoarse breathing, because she knew about the passion of men like that hot-blooded, because Bertha Supple told her once in dead secret and made her swear she'd never, about the gentle gentleman lodger that was staying with them out of the congested district's board that had pictures cut out of papers of those skirt dancers and high kickers and she said he used to do something not very nice that you could imagine sometimes in the bed but this was altogether different from a thing like that because there was all the difference because she could almost feel him draw her face to his and the first quick hot touch of his handsome lips Besides, there was absolution so long as you didn't do the other thing before being married, and there ought to be women priests that would understand without your telling out, and Sissy Caffrey too sometimes had that dreamy kind of dreamy look in her eyes, so that she too, my dear, and Winnie Rippingham so mad about actress photographs, and besides it was on account of that other thing coming on the way it did. And Jackie Caffrey shouted to look, there was another, and she leaned back, and the garters were blue to match on account of the transparent, and they all saw it and shouted to look. Look, there it was, and she leaned back ever so far to see the fireworks, and something queer was flying about through the air, a soft thing to and fro, dark. And she saw a long Roman candle going up over the trees, up, up, and in the tense hush they were all breathless with excitement as it went higher and higher, and she had to lean back more and more to look up after it, high, high, almost out of sight, and her face was suffused with a divine and entrancing blush from straining back, and he could see her other things, too, neensook knickers, the fabric that caresses the skin, better than those other petty width, the green, four and eleven, on account of being white, and she let him, and she saw that he saw, and then it went so high it went out of sight a moment, and she was trembling in every limb from being bent so far back, he had a full view high up above her knee, no one ever, not even on the swing or waiting, and she wasn't ashamed, and he wasn't either to look in that immodest way like that, because he couldn't resist the sight of the wondrous revealment half offered 
like those skirt dancers behaving so immodest before gentlemen looking and she kept on looking looking she would fain have cried to him chokingly held out her snowy slender arms to him to come to feel his lips laid on her white brow the cry of a young girl's love a little strangled cry wrung from her that cry that has rung through the ages and then a rocket sprang and bang shot blind and oh then the roman candle burst and it was like a, a sigh of oh and every one cried oh oh in raptures and it gushed out of it a stream of rain gold hair threads and they shed and ah they were all greeny dewy stars falling with golden oh so lively oh so soft sweet soft then all melted away dually in the grey air all was silent ah she glanced at him as she bent forward quickly a pathetic little glance of piteous protest of shy reproach under which he coloured like a girl he was leaning back against a rock behind leopold bloom for it is he stands silent with bowed head before those young guileless eyes what a brute he had been at it again a fair unsullied soul had called to him and wretch that he was how had he answered an utter cad he had been he of all men but there was an infinite store of mercy in those eyes for him too a word of pardon even though he had erred and sinned and wandered should a girl tell no a thousand times no that was their secret only theirs alone in the hiding twilight and there was none to know or tell save the little bat that flew so softly through the evening to and fro and little bats don't tell Sissy Caffrey whistled, imitating the boys in the football field to show what a great person she was, and then she cried, "'Gertie! Gertie! We're going! Come on! We can see from farther up!' Gertie had an idea, one of love's little ruses. She slipped a hand into her kerchief park pocket and took out the wadding and waved in reply, of course, without letting him, and then slipped it back. Wonder if he's too far, too. She rose. Was it goodbye? No. She had to go, but they would meet again, there, and she would dream of that till then, tomorrow, of her dream of yester eve. She drew herself up to her full height. Their souls met in a last lingering glance, and the eyes that reached her heart, full of a strange shining, hung enraptured on her sweet flower-like face. She half smiled at him wanly, a sweet forgiving smile, a smile that verged on tears, and then they parted. Slowly, without looking back, she went down the uneven strand to Sissy, to Edie, to Jackie and Tommy Caffrey, the little baby boardman. It was darker now, and there were stones and bits of wood on the strand and slippy seaweed. She walked with a certain quiet dignity characteristic of her, but with care, and very slowly, because Gertie McDowell was... Tight boots? No, she's lame. Oh! Mr. Bloom watched her as she limped away. Poor girl. That's why she's left on the shelf and the others did a sprint. Thought something was wrong by the cut of her jib. Jilted beauty. A defect is ten times worse in a woman, but makes them polite. Glad I didn't know it when she was on show. Hot little devil all the same. Wouldn't mind. Curiosity like a nun or a negress or a girl with glasses. That squinty one is delicate. Near her monthlies, I expect, makes them feel ticklish. I have such a bad headache today. Where did I put the letter? Yes, all right. All kinds of crazy longings, licking pennies, girl in tranquilla convent that nun told me liked to smell rock oil. Virgins go mad in the end, I suppose. Sister, how many women in Dublin have it today? Martha, she, something in the air. That's the moon. But then why don't all women menstruate at the same time with the same moon, I mean? Depends on the time they were born, I suppose, or all start scratch, then get out of step. Something's Molly and Millie together. Anyhow, I got the best of that. 
Damn glad I didn't do it in the bath this morning over her silly I will punish you letter. Made up for that tram driver this morning. That gouger McCoy stopped me to say nothing. And his wife engagement in the country valise. Voice like a pickaxe. Thankful for small mercies. Cheap, too. Yours for the asking. Because they want it themselves. Their natural craving. Shoals of them every evening poured out of offices. Reserve better. Don't want it, they throw it at you. Catch them alive. Oh, pity they can't see themselves. A dream of well-filled hose. Where was that? Ah, yes. Mutoscope pictures in Capel Street. For men only. Peeping Tom. Woolly's hat and what the girls did with it. Do they snapshot those girls, or is it all a fake? Lingerie does it. Felt for the curves inside her déshabillé. Excites them also when there. I'm all clean. Come and dirty me. And they like dressing one another for the sacrifice. Millie, delighted with Molly's new blouse, at first put them all on to take them all off. Molly, why, I bought her the violet garters. Us, too. The tie he wore, his lovely socks and turned-up trousers. He wore a pair of gaiters the night that first we met. His lovely shirt was shining beneath his what? Of jet. Say a woman loses a dream with every pin she takes out. Pinned together. Oh, Mary lost a pin of her. Dressed up to the nines for somebody. Fashion part of their charm. Just changes when you're on the track of the secret. Except the East. Mary, Martha, now as then. No reasonable offer refused. She wasn't in a hurry, either. Always off to a fellow when they are. They never forget an appointment. Out on spec, probably. They believe in chance, because, like themselves, and the others inclined to give her an odd dig. Girlfriends at school, arms around each other's necks and with ten fingers locked, kissing and whispering secrets about nothing in the convent garden. Nuns with whitewashed faces, cool quaff and their rosaries going up and down, vindictive, too, for what they can't get. Barbed wire. Be sure now and write me. And I'll write to you. Now, won't you? Molly and Josie pal. Till Mr. Wright comes along, then meet once in a blue moon. Tableau. Oh, look who it is, for the love of God. How are you at all? What have you been doing with yourself? Kiss and delighted, too. Kiss to see you. Picking holes in each other's appearance. You're looking splendid. Sister souls showing their teeth at one another. How many have you left? Wouldn't lend each other a pinch of salt. Ah! Devils they are when that's coming on them. Dark devilish appearance. Molly often told me things a ton weight. Molly often told me feel things a ton weight. Scratch the sole of my foot. Oh, that way. Oh, that's exquisite. Feel it myself, too. Good to rest once in a while. Wonder if it's bad to go with him, then. Safe in one way. Turns milk. Makes fiddle string snap. Something about withering plants I read in a garden. Besides, they say if the flower withers, she wears. She's a flirt. All are. Dare say she felt I. When you feel like that, you often meet what you feel. Liked me or what? Dress they look at. Always know a fellow courting collars and comes. Well, cocks and lions do the same and stags. Same time, might prefer a tie undone or something. Trousers? Suppose I, when I was? No. Gently does it. Dislike rough and tumble. Kiss in the dark and never tell. Saw something in me. Wonder what? Sooner have me as I am than some poet chap with bear's grease, plastery hair, love lock over his dexter optic, to aid gentlemen in literary. Ought to attend to my appearance, my age. Didn't let her see me in profile. Still, you never know. Pretty girls and ugly men marrying. Beauty and the beast. Besides, I can't be so if Molly took off her hat to show her hair. Wide brim bought to hide her face, meeting someone might know her, bend down or carry a bunch of flowers to smell, hair strong in rut. Ten bob I got for Molly's combings when we were on the rocks in Hollis Street. Why not? Suppose he gave her money. Why not? All a prejudice. She's worth ten, fifteen, more a pound. All that for nothing. Bold hand. 
Mrs. Marion. Did I forget to write address on that letter like the postcard I sent to Flynn? And the day I went to Drimmy's without a necktie. Wrangle with Molly it was. Put me off. No, I remember. Richie Golding. He's another. Weighs on his mind. Funny my watch stopped at half past four. Dust. Shark liver oil they used to clean. Could do it myself. Save. Was that just when he... She... Oh, he did. Into her. She did. Done. Ah. Mr. Bloom, with careful hand, recomposed his wet shirt. O oh Lord, that little limping devil begins to feel cold and clammy. After effect, not pleasant. Still, you have to get rid of it some way. They don't care. Complimented, perhaps. Go home to nicey bread and milky and say night nighty prayers with the kitties. Well, aren't they? See her as she is spoil all. Must have the stage setting, the rouge, costume, position, music. The name, too. Amour of actresses. Nell Gwynne, Mrs. Bracegirdle, Maud Branscombe. Curtain up. Moonlight silver effulgence. Maiden discovered with pensive bosom. Little sweetheart, come and kiss me. Still, I feel, the strength it gives a man. That's the secret of it. Good job I let off there behind, coming out of Dignam's. Cider, that was. Otherwise, I couldn't have. Makes you want to sing after. La cause est tartare. Suppose I spoke to her. What about? Bad plan, however, if you don't know how to end the conversation. Ask them a question, they ask you another. Good idea if you're in a cart. Wonderful, of course, if you say, Good evening, and you see she's on for it. Good evening. Oh, but the dark evening in the Appian way, I nearly spoke to Mrs. Clinch, oh, thinking she was. Phew! Girl in Meath Street that night. All the dirty things I made her say, all wrong, of course. My arcs, she called it. It's so hard to find one who... Oh, ho! If you don't answer when they solicit, must be horrible for them till they harden. And kissed my hand when I gave her the extra two shillings. Parrots. Press the button and the bird will speak. Squeak. Wished she hadn't called me, sir. Oh, her mouth in the dark. And you a married man with a single girl. That's what they enjoy, taking a man from another woman. Or even hear of it. Different with me. Glad to get away from other chap's wife. Eating off his cold plate. Chap in the Burton today, spitting back gum chewed gristle. French letter still in my pocketbook. Cause of half the trouble. But might happen sometime, I don't think. Come in. All is prepared. I dreamt. What? Worst is beginning. How they change the venue when it's not what they like. Ask you to do like mushrooms because she once knew a gentleman who... Or ask you what someone was going to say when he changed his mind and stopped. Yet if I went the whole hog, say, I want to, something like that. Because I did, she too, offend her. Then make it up. <clears throat> Pretend to want something awfully. Then cry off for her sake. Flatters them. She must have been thinking of someone else all the time. What harm? Must, since she came to the use of reason, he, he, and he. First kiss does the trick. The propitious moment. Something inside them goes pop. Mushy-like. Tell by their eye on the sly. First thoughts are best. Remember that till their dying day. Molly, Lieutenant Mulvey, that kissed her under the Moorish wall beside the gardens. Fifteen, she told me. But her breasts were developed. Fell asleep then. After Jing Cree dinner, that was when we drove home, the Featherbed Mountain, gnashing her teeth in sleep. Lord Mayor had his eye on her, too. Val Dillon, apoplectic. There she is with him down there for the fireworks, my fireworks, up like a rocket, down like a stick. And the children, twins, they must be waiting for something to happen, want to be grown-ups, dressing, <clears throat> dressing in mother's clothes, time enough, understand all the ways of the world. And the dark one with the mop head and the nigger mouth. I knew she could whistle. Mouth made for that. Like Molly. Why, that high-class whore in jammets wore her veil only to her nose. Would you mind, please, telling me the right time? I'll tell you the right time up a dark lane. Say prunes and prisms forty times every morning. Cure for fat lips. 
caressing the little boy too. Onlookers see most of the game. Of course they understand birds, animals, babies, in their line. Didn't look back when she was going down the strand. Wouldn't give that satisfaction. Those girls, those girls, those lovely seaside girls. Fine eyes she had, clear. It's the white of the eye brings that out, not so much the pupil. Did she know what I... Course. Like a cat sitting beyond a dog's jump. Women never meet one like that Wilkins in the high school drawing a picture of Venus with all his belongings on show. Call that innocence? Poor idiot. His wife has her work cut out for her. Never see them sit on a bench marked wet paint. Eyes all over them. Look under the bed for what's not there. Longing to get the fright of their lives. Sharp as needles they are. When I said to Molly the man at the corner of Cuff Street was good-looking, thought she might like, twigged at once he had a false arm. Had to. Where do they get that? Typist going up Roger Green's stairs two at a time to show her understandings. Handed down from father to mother to daughter, I mean. Bread and the bone. Milly, for example, drawing her handkerchief on the mirror to save the ironing. Best place for an ad to catch a woman's eye on a mirror. And when I sent her for Molly's Paisley shawl to Prescott's, by the way that ad I must, carrying home the change in her stocking. Clever little minx. I never told her. Neat way she carried parcels, too. Attract men, small thing like that. Holding up her hand, shaking it, to let the blood flow back when it was red. Who did you learn that from? Nobody. Something the nurse taught me. Oh, don't they know? Three years old she was in front of Molly's dressing table just before we left Lombard Street West. Me have a nice face, Mullingar. Who knows? Ways of the world. Young student. Straight on her pins, anyway. Not like the other. Still, she was game. Lord, I am wet. Devil you are. A swell of her calf. Transparent stockings stretched to breaking point. Not like that front today. A. E. Rumpled. Stockings. Or the one in Grafton Street. White. Wow. Beef to the heel. A monkey puzzle rocket burst, spluttering and darting crackles. Zrads and zrads, zrads, zrads. And Sissy and Tommy ran out to sea, and Edie after with the push car, and then Gertie beyond the curve of the rocks. Will she? Watch. Watch. See? Looked round. She smelt an onion. Darling, I saw your... I saw all... Lord! Did me good all the same. Off color after Kiernan's dignums. For this relief much thanks. In Hamlet, that is. Lord! It was all things combined. Excitement. When she leaned back felt an ache at the butt of my tongue. Your head it simply swirls. He's right. Might have made a worse fool of myself, however. Instead of talking about nothing, then I will tell you all still it was a kind of language between us it couldn't be no gertie they called her might be false name however like my and the address dolphin's barn a blind her maiden name was jemima brown and she lived with her mother in irish town place made me think of that i suppose all tarred with the same brush wiping pens in their stockings but the ball rolled down to her as if it understood. Every bullet has its billet. Of course I never could throw anything straight at school, crooked as a ram's horn. Sad, however, because it lasts only a few years till they settle down to pot walloping, and Papa's pants will soon fit Willie, and Fuller's earth for the baby when they hold him out to do ah-ah. Uh -uh. No soft job. Saves them. Keeps them out of harm's way. Nature. Washing child, washing corpse, dignum, children's hands always round them, coconut skulls, monkeys, not even closed at first, sour milk in their swaddles and tainted curds. Oughtn't to have given that child an empty teat to suck. Fill it up with wind. Mrs. Beaufoy, Purefoy, must call to the hospital. Wonder is Nurse Callum there still? She used to look over some nights when Molly was in the coffee palace. That young doctor O'Hare, I noticed her brushing his coat. And Mrs. Breen and Mrs. Dignam once like that too, marriageable. Worst of all at night, Mrs. Dugan told me in the city arms. Husband rolling and drunk, stink of pub off him like a polecat. Have that in your nose in the dark, whiff of stale booze. Then ask in the morning, was I drunk last night? 
Bad policy, however, to fault the husband. Chickens come home to roost. They stick by one another like glue. Maybe the women's fault also. That's where Molly can knock spots off them. It is the blood of the South. Moorish. Also the form, the figure. Hands felt for the opulent. Just compare, for instance, those others. Wife locked up at home. Skeleton in the cupboard. Allow me to introduce my... Then they trot you out some kind of a nondescript, wouldn't call, wouldn't know what to call her. Always see a fellow's weak point in his wife. Still there's destiny in it, falling in love. Have their own secrets between them. Chaps that would go to the dogs if some woman didn't take them in hand. Then little cheats of girls, height of a chilling in coppers with little hubbies. As God made them, he matched them. Sometimes children turn out well enough. Twice not makes one. Or old rich chap of seventy and blushing bride, marry in May and repent in December. This wet is very unpleasant. Stuck. Well, the foreskin is not back. Better detach. Ow! Other hand a six-footer with a wifey up to his watch-pocket. Long and the short of it, big he and little she. Very strange about my watch. Wrist watches are always going wrong. Wonder is there any magnetic influence between the person, because that was about the time he, <clears throat> yes, I suppose at once, cats away the mice will play. I remember looking in Pill Lane. Also, that now is magnetism. Back of everything magnetism. Earth, for instance, pulling this and being pulled, that causes movement. And time? Well, that's the time the movement takes. Then if one thing stopped, the whole gesapo would stop bit by bit, because it's arranged. Magnetic needle tells you what's going on in the sun, the stars, little piece of steel iron. When you hold out the fork, come, come, tip, woman and man, that is, fork and steel, molly, he. Dress up and look and suggest and let you see and see more and defy you if you're a man to see that and like a sneeze coming legs look look and if you have any guts in you tip have to let fly and that's the end of chapter 13 part 3 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Ulysses by James Joyce, Chapter 13, Part 4, recorded by Bob Foster, Montreal, March 2006. Wonder how is she feeling in that region? Shame all put on before third person. More put out about a hole in her stocking. Molly, her under jaw stuck out, head back, about the farmer in the riding boots and spurs at the horse show. And when the painters were in Lombard Street West, fine voice that fellow had how juglini began smell that i did like flowers it was too violets came from the turpentine probably in the paint make their own use of everything same time doing it scraped her slipper on the floor so they wouldn't hear but lots of them can't kick the beam i think keep that thing up for hours kind of a general all round over me and half down my back wait hmm Hmm, yes, that's her perfume. Why, she waved her hand. I leave you this to think of me when I'm far away on the pillow. What is it? Heliotrope? No. Hyacinth? Hmm, roses, I think. She'd like scent of that kind. Sweet and cheap, soon sour. Why, Molly likes apoponax. Suits her with a little jessamine mixed. Her high notes and her low notes. At the, at the dance night she met him dance of the hours heat brought it out she was wearing her black and it had the perfume of the time before good conductor is it or bad light too suppose there's some connection for instance if you go into a cellar where it's dark mysterious thing too why did i smell it only now took its time in coming like herself slow but sure suppose it's ever so many millions of tiny grains blown across Yes, it is, because those Spice Islands, Singalese, this morning, smell them leagues off. Tell you what it is. It's like a fine veil, or web they have all over the skin, fine like, what do you call it, gossamer, and, and, and they're always spinning it out of them. 
Fine as anything. Rainbow colours without knowing it. Clings to everything she takes off. Vamp of her stockings. Warm shoe. Stays. Drawers. Little kick taking them off. Bye-bye till next time. Bye-bye till next time. Also, the cat likes to sniff in her shift on the bed. Know her smell on a thousand. Bath water, too. Reminds me of strawberries and cream. Wonder where it is, really. There or the armpits are under the neck. Because you get it out of all holes and corners. Hyacinth perfume made of oil or ether or something. Muskrat. Bag under their tails. One grain pour-off odor for years. Dogs at each other behind. Good evening. Evening. How do you sniff? Hmm. Hmm. Very well, thank you. Animals go by that. Yes, now look at it that way. We're the same. Some women, for instance, warn you off when they have their period. Come near. Then get a hogo. You could hang your hat on. Like what? Potted herrings gone stale or boof. Please keep off the grass. Perhaps they get a man smell off us. What, though? Cigari, cigari gloves. Long John had on his desk the other breath. What you eat and drink gives that. No, man smell, I mean. Must be connected with that because priests that are supposed to be are different. Women buzz around it like flies around treacle. Railed off the altar, get on to it at any cost. The tree of forbidden priest. Oh, father, will you let me be the first to? That diffuses itself all over, all through the body, permeates. Source of life. And it's extremely curious to smell. Celery sauce. Let me. Mr. Bloom inserted his nose. Hmm. Into the... Hmm. Opening of his waistcoat. Almonds or... No. Lemons it is. Ah, no. That, that's the soap. Oh, by the by, that lotion. I knew there was something on my mind. Never went back and the soap not paid. Dislike carrying bottles like that hag this morning. Hines might have paid me that three shillings. I couldn't mention Meagers just to remind him. Still, if he works that paragraph, two and nine, bad opinion of me he'll have. Call tomorrow. How much do I owe you? Three and nine? Two and nine, sir? Ah, might stop him giving credit another time. Lose your customers that way. Pubs do. Fellow run up a bill on the slate and then slinking round the back streets into somewhere else. Here's this nobleman passed before, blown in from the bay, just went as far as turn back, always at home at dinner time, looks mangled out, and had a good tuck in, enjoying nature now, grace after meals, after supper walk a mile, sure he has a small bank balance somewhere, government sit, walk after him, now make him awkward like these newsboys me today. Still, you learn something. See ourselves as others see us, so long as women don't mock what matter. That's the way to find out. Ask yourself, who is he now? The mystery man on the beach. Prize titbit story by Leopold Bloom. Payment at the rate of one guinea per column. And that fellow today at the graveside in the brown Macintosh. Corns on his kismet, however. Healthy, perhaps, absorb all the... Whistle brings rain, they say. Must be some somewhere. Salt in the Ormond damp. The body feels the atmosphere. Old Betty's joints are on the rack. Mother Shipton's prophecy, that is, about ships around they fly in the twinkling. No, signs of rain it is. The royal reader and distant hills seem coming nigh. Health. Bailey light. Two, four, six, eight. Nine C has to change, or they might think it a house. Wreckers, Grace, darling, people afraid of the dark, also glow worms, cyclists, lighting up time, jewels, diamonds, flash better. Light is a kind of reassuring, not going to hurt you. Better now, of course, than long ago. Country roads run you through the small guts for nothing. Still, two types there are. You bob against. Scowl or smile. Pardon. Not at all. Best time to spray plants too in the shade after the sun. Some light still. Red rays are longest. Roy Begive Vance taught us red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. A star, I see. Venus? Can't tell yet. Two, when three, it's night. Were those night clouds there all the time? 
Looks like a phantom ship. No, wait. Trees, are they? An optical illusion. Mirage. Land of the setting sun, this. Home rule sun setting in the southeast. My native land. Good night. Dew falling. Bad for you, dear, to sit on that stone. Brings on white fluxions. Never have little baby then, lest he was big strong fight his way up through. Might get piles myself. Sticks too, like a summer cold, sore on the mouth. Cut with grass or paper worst. Friction of the position. Like to be that rock she sat on. Oh, sweet little, you don't know how nice you looked. I begin to like them at that age. Green apples. Grab at all that offer. Suppose it's the only time we cross legs. Seated. Also the library today, those girl graduates. Happy chairs under them. But it's the evening influence. They feel all that open like flowers, know their hours, sunflowers, Jerusalem artichokes and ballrooms, chandeliers, avenues under the lamps, nightstock in Matt Dillon's garden where I kissed her shoulder. Wish I had a full-length oil painting of her then. June that was, too, I wooed. The year returns. History repeats itself. Ye crags and peaks, I'm with you once again. Life, love, voyage around your own little world. And now... Sad about her lame, of course, but must be on your guard not to feel too much pity. They take advantage. All quiet on Howth now, the distant hills seem, where we, the rhododendrons. I am a fool, perhaps. He gets the plums and I the plum stones. Where I come in, all that old hill has seen. Names change, that's all. Lovers, yum yum. Tired I feel now. Oh, will I get up? Oh, wait. Drained all the manhood out of me, little wretch. She kissed me. My youth, never again, only once it comes, or hers. Take the train there tomorrow. No, nope. returning not the same. Like kids, your second visit to a house. The new I want. Nothing new under the sun. Care of P.O. Dolphin's barn. Are you not happy in your... Naughty, darling. At Dolphin's barn, charades in Luke Doyle's house. Matt Dillon and his bevy of daughters. Tiny, eighty, Floey, Mamie, Louie, Hetty, Molly, too. Eighty-seven, that was. Year before we... And the old major partial to his drop of spirits. Curious, she an only child. I an only child, so it returns. Think you're escaping and run into yourself. Longest way round is the shortest way home. And just when he and she... Circus horse walking in a ring. Rip them winkle we played. Rip tear in Henny Doyle's overcoat. Van, bread van delivering. Winkle. Cockles and periwinkles. Then I did rip Van Winkle coming back. She leaned on the sideboard watching. Moorish eyes. Twenty years asleep in sleepy hollow. All changed. Forgotten. The younger old. His gun rusty from the dew. Bah! What is that flying about? Swallow? Bat, probably. Thinks I'm a tree so blind. Have birds no smell? Metempsychosis. They believed you could be changed into a tree from grief. Weeping willow. Bah! There he goes. Funny little beggar. Wonder where he lives. Belfry up there, very likely, hanging by his heels in the odor of sanctity. Bell scared him out, I suppose. Mass seems to be over. Could hear them all at it. Pray for us, and pray for us, and pray for us. Good idea, the repetition. Same thing with ads. Buy from us, and buy from us. Yes, there is the light in the priest's house. Their frugal meal. Remember about the mistake in the valuation when I was in Tom's. Twenty-eight it is. Two houses they have. Gabriel Conroy's brother is curate. Bah! Again! Wonder why they come out at night like mice. They're a mixed breed. Birds are like hopping mice. What frightens them? Light or noise? Better sit still. An instinct, like the bird in troth got water out of the end of a jar by throwing in pebbles. Like a little man in a cloak he is, with tiny hands, weeny bones, almost see them shimmering, kind of a bluey white. Colors depend on the light you see. Stare at the sun, for example, like the eagle, then look at a shoe, see a blotch, blob, yellowish, wants to stamp his trademark on everything. Instance, that cat this morning on the staircase. Color of brown turf. Say you never see them with three colors. Not true. That half tabby white tortoise shell in the city arms with a letter M on her forehead. 
Body, fifty different colours. Howth, a while ago, amethyst. Glass flashing. That's how that wise man... What's his name with the burning glass? Then the heather goes on fire. It can't be tourists' matches. What? Perhaps the sticks dry rub together in the wind and light, or broken bottles in the furs act as a burning glass in the sun. Archimedes, I have it. My memory's not so bad. Bah! Who knows what they're always flying for? Insects? That bee last week got into the room playing with his shadow on the ceiling. Might be the one bit me. Come back to see. Birds, too, never find out what they say. Like our small talk, and says she, and says he. Nerve. They have to fly over the ocean and back. Lot must be killed in storms, telegraph wires. Dreadful life sailors have, too. Big brutes of ocean-going steamers floundering along in the dark, lowing out like sea cows. Thaw a bola. Out of that, bloody curse to you. Others in vessels, bit of a handkerchief sail, pitched about like snuff at a wake when the stormy winds do blow. Married, too, sometimes away for years at the ends of the earth somewhere. No ends, really, because it's round. Wife in every port, they say. She has a good job if she minds it till Johnny comes marching home again, if ever he does, smelling the tail end of ports. How can they like the sea? Yet they do. The anchor's weighed off. He sails with a scapular or metal on him for luck. Well, and the teflon. No, what's this they call it? Poor Papa's father had on his door to touch. That brought us out of the land of Egypt and into the house of bondage. Something in all those superstitions, because when you go out, never know what dangers. Hanging on to a plank or a stride of a beam for grim life, life belt round, round him, gulping salt water, and that's the last of his nibs, till the sharks catch hold of him. Do fish ever get seasick? Then you have a beautiful calm without a cloud, smooth sea, placid crew and cargo in smithereens, Davy Jones' locker, moon looking down, not my fault, old cockalorum. A lost long candle wandered up the sky from Mira's bazaar in search of funds for Mercer's hospital, and broke, drooping, and shed a cluster of violet but one white stars. They floated, fell, they faded. The shepherd's hour, the hour of holding, hour of tryst, from house to house giving his ever-welcome double-knock, went the nine o'clock postman, the glow-worm's lamp at his belt gleaming here and there through the laurel hedges, and among the five young trees a hoisted lint-stock lit the lamp at Leahy's terrace. By screens of lighted windows, by equal gardens, a shrill voice went crying, wailing, Evening telegraph, stop press edition, result of the gold cup brace. And from the door of Dignam's house a boy ran out and called. Twittering the black flew here, the bat flew here, flew there. Far out over the sands the coming surf crept, gray. Health settled for slumber, tired of long days, and of yum-yum rhododendrons. He was old. And felt gladly the night breeze lift, ruffle his fell of ferns. He lay but opened a red eye, unsleeping, deep and slowly breathing, slumberous but awake. And far on Kish Bank the anchored lightship twinkled, winked at Mr. Bloom. Life, those chaps out there must have, stuck in the same spot, Irish lights bored. Penance for their sins, coast guards too, rockets, and breeches boy and lifeboat. Day we went out for the pleasure cruise and the errands king, throwing them the sack of old papers, bears in the zoo, filthy trip, drunkards out to take up their livers, drunkards out to shake up their livers, puking overboard to feed the herrings, nausea, and the women, fear of God in their faces, Millie, no sign of funk. Her blue scarf loose, laughing. Don't know what death is at that age. And then their stomachs clean. But being lost, they fear. When we hid behind the tree at Crumlin, I didn't want to. Mama! Mama! Babes in the wood. Frightening them with masks, too. Throwing them up in the air to catch them. I'll murder you. Is it only half fun? Or children playing battle? Whole earnest. How can people aim guns at each other? Sometimes they go off. 
poor kids. Only troubles. Wildfire and nettle rash. Calomel purge I got her for that. After getting better asleep with Molly. Very same teeth she has. What do they love? Another themselves? But the morning she chased her with the umbrella, perhaps so as not to hurt. I felt her pulse. Ticking. Little hand it was. Now big. Dearest Papley. All that the hand says when you touch. Love to count my waistcoat, waistcoat buttons. Her first days, I remember, made me laugh to see. Little paps to begin with. Left one is more sensitive, I think. Mine, too, near the heart. Padding themselves out if fat is in fashion. Her growing pains at night, calling, awakening me. Frightened she was when her nature came on her first. Poor child. Strange moment for the mother, too. Brings back her girlhood. Gibraltar. Looking from Buena Vista. O'Hara's tower. The seabird screaming. Old Barbary ape that gobbled all his family. Sundown. Gunfire for the men to cross the lines. Looking out over the sea, she told me. Evening like this, but clear. No clouds. I always thought I'd marry a lord or a gentleman with a private yacht. Buenas noches, senorita. El hombre ama la muchacha hermosa. Why me? Because you were so foreign from the others. Better not stick here all night like a limpet. This weather makes you dull. Must be getting on for nine by the light. Go home. Too late for Leah Lily of Killarney. No. Might be still up. Call to the hospital to see. Hope she's over. Long day I've had. Martha, the bath, funeral, house of keys, museum with those goddesses, Daedalus's song, then that baller and Barney Kiernan's. Got my own back there, drunken ranters. What I said about his God made him wince. Mistake to hit back? N or? No. Ought to go home and laugh at themselves. Always want to be swilling in company. Afraid to be alone like a child of two. Suppose he hit me. Look at it other way round. Not so bad, then. Perhaps not to hurt, he meant. Three cheers for Israel. Three cheers for the sister-in-law he hawked about. Three fangs in her mouth. Same style of beauty. Particularly nice old party for a cup of tea. The sister of the wife of the wild man of Borneo has just come to town. Imagine that, in the early morning at close range, every one to his taste, as Morris said when he kissed the cow. But Dignam's put the boots on it. Houses of mourning so depressing because you never know. Anyhow she wants the money. Must call to those Scottish widows, as I promised. Strange name. Takes it for granted when we're going to pop off first. That widow on Monday was it. Outside Kramers that looked at me. Buried the poor husband, but progressing favorably on the premium. Her widow's might fell well. What do you expect her to do? Must wheedle her way along. Widower, I hate to see. Look so forlorn. Poor man's O'Connor wife and five children poisoned by mussels here. The sewage, hopeless. Some good matronly woman in a pork pie hat to mother him. Take him in a tow, platter face in a large apron, ladies grey flannelette bloomers, three shillings a pair, astonishing bargain, plain and loved, loved for ever, they say, ugly. No woman thinks she is. Love, lie and be handsome for tomorrow we die. See him sometimes walking about trying to find out who played the trick. You, P, up. Fate, that is. He, not me. Also a shop, often noticed. Curse seems to dog it. Dreamt last night? Wait, something confused. She had red slippers on. Turkish. Wore the breeches. Suppose she does. Would I like her in pajamas? Damned hard to answer. Nanetti's gone. Mail boat. Near Hollyhead by now. Must nail that ad of keys. Work Hines and Crawford. Petticoats for Molly. She has something to put in them. What's that? Might be honey. Mr. Bloom stooped and turned over a piece of paper on the strand. He brought it near his eyes and peered. Letter? No. Can't read. Better go. Better. I'm tired to move. Page of an old copy book. All those holes and pebbles. Who could count them? Never know what you find. Bottle with the story of a treasure in it thrown from a wreck. Parcels. Post. Children always want to throw things in the sea. Trust. Bread cast on the waters. What's this? Bit of stick. 
Oh, exhausted that female has me. Not so young now. Will she come here tomorrow? Wait for her somewhere forever. Must come back. Murder, murderers do. Will I? Mr. Bloom, with his stick, gently vexed the thick sand at his foot. Write a message for her. Might remain. What? I. Some flat-foot tramp on it in the morning. Useless. Washed away, tide comes in here a pool near her foot. Bend, see my face there, dark mirror, breathe on it, stirs. All these rocks with lines and scars and letters, oh, those transparent. Besides, they don't know. What is the meaning of that other world? I called you naughty boy because I do not like. Am. A. M. A. No room. Let it go. Mr. Bloom effaced the letters with his slow boot. Hopeless thing, sand. Nothing grows in it. All fades. No fear of big vessels coming up here, except Guinness's barges, round the kish in eighty days, done half by design. He flung his wooden pin away. The stick fell in silted sand, stuck. Now if you were trying to do that for a week on end, you couldn't. Chance. We'll never meet again, but it was lovely. Goodbye, dear. Thanks. Made me feel so young. Oh, short snooze now if I had... Must be near nine. Liverpool boat long gone. Not even the smoke. And she can do the other. Did, too. And Belfast. I won't go. Race there. Race back to Ennis. Let him. Just close my eyes a moment. Won't sleep, though. Half dream. It never comes the same. Bat again. No harm in him. Just a few... Oh, sweetie, all your little girl white up I saw a dirty brace girdle made me do love sticky. We two naughty grace. Darling, she him half past the bed met him pike hoses. Frillies for Raoul to perfume your wife. Black hair heave under imbon. Signorita, young eyes, mulvy, plump years, dreams, return tail end, agandath. Swoony, lovey, showed me her next year and drawers return next in her next her next a bat flew here there here far in the grey a bell chimed mr bloom with open mouth his left boot sanded sideways leaned breathed just for a few cuckoo 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 the clock on the mantelpiece in the priest's house cooed where oak Canon O'Hanlon and Father Conroy and the Reverend John Hughes, S.J., were taking tea and soda bread and butter and fried mutton chops with ketchup and talking about cuckoo, 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 because it was a little canary bird, bird that came out of its little house to tell the time that Gertie McDowell noticed the time she was there because she was as quick as anything about a thing like that was Gertie McDowell, and she noticed at once that that foreign gentleman that was sitting on the rocks looking was cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. And that's the end of Chapter 13, Part 4 of Ulysses by James Joyce. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce Chapter 14 Desil Holles Eamus Desil Holles Eamus Desil Holles Eamus Send us bright one, light one, whorehorn, quickening and womb fruit. Send us bright one, light one, Horhorn quickening and womb fruit. Send us bright one, light one, horhorn quickening and womb fruit. Hoopsa boy a boy, hoopsa. Hoopsa boy a boy, hoopsa. Hoopsa boy a boy, hoopsa. Universally, that person's acumen is esteemed very little perceptive concerning whatsoever matters are being held as most profitably by mortals with sapience endowed to be studied. 
who is ignorant of that which the most in doctrine erudite and certainly by reason of that in them high minds ornament deserving of veneration constantly maintain when by general consent they affirm that other circumstances being equal by no exterior splendor is the prosperity of a nation more efficaciously asserted than by the measure of how far forward may have progressed the tribute of its solicitude for that proliferant continuance which of evils the original if it be absent when fortunately present constitutes the certain sign of omnipotent nature's incorrupted benefaction for who is there who anything of some significance has apprehended but is conscious that that exterior splendor may be the surface of a downward tending lutulent reality or on the contrary any one so is there unilluminated as not to perceive that as no nature's boon can contend against the bounty of increase so it behoves every most just citizen to become the exhortator and admonisher of his semblables and to tremble lest what had in the past been by the nation excellently commenced might be in the future not with similar excellence accomplished. If an invericund habit shall have gradually traduced the honorable by ancestors transmitted customs to that thither of profundity, that that one was audacious excessively who would have the hardihood to rise affirming that no more odious offense can for any one be than to oblivious neglect to consign that evangel simultaneously command and promise which on all mortals with prophecy of abundance or with diminutions menace that exalted of reiteratedly procreating function ever irrevocably enjoined. It is not why, therefore, we shall wonder if, as the best historians relate, among the Celts, who nothing that was not in its nature admirable admired, the art of medicine shall have been highly honored. Not to speak of hostels, leper-yards, sweating-chambers, plague-graves, their greatest doctors, the O'Shiels, the O'Hickeys, the O'Lees, have sedulously set down the diverse methods by which the sick and the relapsed found again health, whether the malady had been the trembling withering or loose boyconnel flux. Certainly in every public work which in it anything of gravity contains preparation should be with importance commensurate, and therefore a plan was by them adopted, whether by having preconsidered, or as the maturation of experience, it is difficult in being said, which the discrepant opinions of subsequent inquirers are not up to the present congrued to render manifest. Whereby maternity was so far from all accident possibility removed, that whatever care the patient in that all hardest of woman hour chiefly required, and not solely for the copiously opulent, but also for her who, not being sufficiently moneyed scarcely, and often not even scarcely could subsist valiantly, and for an inconsiderable emolument was provided. To her nothing already then and thenceforward was any way able to be molestful, for this chiefly felt all citizens except with proliferant mothers, prosperity at all not to can be, and as they had received eternity, gods, mortals, generation, to befit them with her beholding. When the case was so hoving itself, parturient in vehicle, thereward carrying desire, immense among all one another, was impelling on of her to be received into that domicile. O thing of prudent nation, not merely in being seen, but also even in being related worthy of being praised, that they her by anticipation went seeing mother, that she by them suddenly to be about to be cherished had been begun she felt. Before born bliss babe had, within womb one he worshipped, whatever in that one case done commodiously done was, a couch by midwives attended with wholesome food reposeful, cleanest swaddles as though forth bringing were now done, and by wise foresight set, but to this no less of what drugs there is need, and surgical implements which are pertaining to her case, not omitting aspect of all very distracting spectacles, in various latitudes by our terrestrial orb offered together with images, divine and human, the cogitation of which by sejunct females is to tumescence conducive, or eases issue in the high, sun-bright, well-built, fair home of mothers when, ostensibly far gone and reproductive, it is come by her thereto to lie in her term up. Some man that wayfaring was stood by house door at night's oncoming, of Israel's folk was that man, that on earth wandering far had fared. Stark ruth of man his errand that him lone led till that house. Of that house A. Horn is lord. 
Seventy beds keeps he there, teeming mothers are wont that they lie for to thole and bring forth bairns hail, so God's angel to Mary quoth. Watchers tway their walk, white sisters in ward sleepless. Smarts they still, sickness soothing, in twelve moods thrice an hundred. Truest bed things they twain are, for horn holding wariest ward. In ward wary the watcher hearing come that man mild-hearted eft rising with swire you wimpled to him her gate wide undid. Lo, levin leaping lightens in eye blink Ireland's westward welkin. Full she dread that God, the reeker all mankind, would fordo with water for his evil sins. Christ's rood made she on breastbone, and him drew that he would rave in fair under her thatch. That man her will wadding worthful went in Horn's house. Loath to irk in Horn's hall, hat holding the seeker stood. On her stow he ere was living with dear wife and lovesome daughter that then over land and sea floor nine years had long out wandered. Once her in town hive meeting he to her bow had not doffed. Her to forgive now he craved with good ground of her allowed that that of him swift seen face, hers so young then had looked. Light swift her eyes kindled, bloom of blushes his word winning. As her eyes then ungot his weeds swart, therefore sorrow she feared, glad after she was that ere a dread was. Her he asked if O'Hare doctor tidings sent from far coast, and she with grameful sigh him answered that O'Hare doctor in heaven was. Sad was the man that word to hear that him so heavied in bowels ruthful. All she there told him, Ruing death for friends so young, Algate sore unwilling God's right wiseness to withsay. She said that he had a fair sweet death, Though God his goodness with mass priest to be shriven, Holy ounsel and sick men's oil to his limbs. The man then right earnest asked the nun Of which death the dead man was died, And the nun answered him and said that he was died in Mona Island, Through belly crab three year agone come childermas and she prayed to God the all-ruthful to have his dear soul in his undeathliness. He heard her sad words, in held hat sad staring. So stood they there, both a while, in one hope sorrowing one with other. Therefore, every man, look to that last end that is thy death, and the dust that gripeth on every man that is born of woman. For as he came naked forth from his mother's womb, so naked shall he wend him at the last for to go as he came. The man that was come into the house then spoke to the nursing woman, and he asked her how it fared with the woman that lay there in childbed. The nursing woman answered him, and said that woman was in throes now full three days, and that it would be a hard birth enough to bear, but that now in a little it would be. She said there too that she had seen many births of women, but never was none so hard as was that woman's birth. Then she set it all forth to him, for because she knew the man that time was had lived nigh that house. The man hearkened to her words for which he felt with wonder woman's woe in the travail that they have of motherhood, and he wondered to look on her face that was a fair face for any man to see, but yet was she left after long years a handmaid. Nine twelve blood flows chiding her childless. And whilst they spake the door of the castle was opened, and there nighed them a mickle noise as of many that sat there at meat. And there came against the place as they stood a young learning knight yclept Dixon, and the traveller Leopold was couth to him, sithen it had happed that they had had ado with each other in the house of Misericord, where this learning knight lay by cause, the traveller Leopold came there to be healed, for he was sore wounded in his breast by a spear, wherewith a horrible and dreadful dragon was smitten him, for which he did do make a salve of volatile salt and chrism as much as he might suffice. And he said now that he should go into that castle for to make merry with them that were there, and the traveller Leopold said that he should go other whither, for he was a man of cottles and a subtle. Also the lady was of his avis, and reprieved the learning knight, though she trowed well that the traveller had said thing that was false for his subtlety. But the learning knight would not hear say nay, nor do her mandament nay have him in aught contrarious to his list, and he said how it was a marvellous castle. And the traveller Leopold went into the castle for to rest him for a space, being sore of limb after many marches environing in diverse lands, and sometime venery. And in the castle was set a board that was of birchwood of Finlandy, and it was upheld by four dwarfmen of that country, but they durst not move more for enchantment. 
and on this board were frightful swords and knives that are made in a great cavern by swinking demons out of white flames that they fixed then in the horns of buffaloes and stags that there abound marvellously. And there were vessels that are wrought by magic of mayhound out of season, and the air by a warlock with his breath, that he blazes into them like to bubbles. And full fair cheer and rich was on the board that no white could devise a fuller nay richer. And there was a vat of silver that was moved by craft to open in the which lay strange fishes withouten heads, though misbelieving men nigh that this be a possible thing without they see nathless they are so. And these fishes lie in an oily water brought there from Portugal land, because of the fatness that therein is like to the juices of the olive press. And also it was a marvel to see in that castle how by magic they make a compost out of fecund wheat kidneys, out of chaldi, that by aid of certain angry spirits that they do into it swells up wondrously like to a vast mountain. And they teach the serpents there to entwine themselves up on long sticks out of the ground, and of the scales of these serpents they brew out a brewage like to mead. And the learning knight let pour for child Leopold a draught, and help thereto all the while all that they were there drank every each. And child Leopold did up his beaver for to pleasure him, and took apparently somewhat in amenity, for he never drank no manner of mead which he then put by, and anon full privily he voided the more part in his neighbour glass, and his neighbour nist of this while. And he sat down in that castle with them for to rest him there a while. Thanked be Almighty God. This, meanwhile, this good sister stood by the door, and begged them at the reverence of Jesu our author liege lord to leave their wassailing, for there was above one quick with child, a gentle dame whose time hide fast. Sir Leopold heard on the up-floor cry on high, and he wondered what cry that it was whether of child or woman, and I marvel, said he, that it be not come or now. Meseems it dureth over long. And he was ware, and saw Franklin that hight Lenahan on that side, the table that was older than any of the tother, and for that they both were knights virtuous in the one emprise, and eke by cause that he was elder, he spoke to him full gently. But, said he, or it be long, too, she will bring forth by God his bounty, and have joy of her childing, for she hath waited marvellous long. And the Franklin that had drunk, and said, expecting each moment to be her next. Also he took the cup that stood to fore him, for him needed never none asking nor desiring of him to drink, and, now drink, said he, fully delectably, and he quaffed as far as he might to their both's health, for he was a passing good man of his lustiness. And Sir Leopold, that was the goodliest guest that ever sat in Scholar's Hall, and that was the meekest man, and the kindest that ever laid husbandly hand under hen, and that was the very truest knight of the world, one that ever did minion service to Lady Gentle, pledged him courtly in the cup, woman's woe with wonder pondering. Now let us speak of that fellowship that was there to the intent to be drunken, and they might. There was a sort of scholars along either side the board, that is, to wit, Dixon eclept junior of St. Mary Merciables, with other his fellows, Lynch and Madden, scholars of medicine, and the Franklin that hight Lenahan, and one from Alba Longa, one Crothers, and young Stephen that had mean of a frere that was at head of the board, and Costello, that men clep in Punch Costello, all long of a mastery of him erewhile jested. And all of them, reserved young Stephen, he was the most drunken that demanded still of more mead, and beside the meek Sir Leopold. But on young Malachi they waited, for that he promised to have come, and such as intended to know goodness said how he had broke his avow. And Sir Leopold sat with them, for he bore fast friendship to Sir Simon, and to this his son, young Stephen, and for that his languor becalmed him there after longest wanderings, insomuch as they feasted him for that time in the honourablest manner. Ruth read him, love led on with will to wander, loath to leave. For they were right witty scholars, and he heard their arsoons each gen other as touching birth and righteousness, young Madden maintaining that put such case it were hard the wife to die, for so it had fallen out a matter of some year agone, with a woman of Eblana in Horn's house, that now was trespassed out of this world, and the self night next before her death all leeches and apothecaries had taken counsel of her case. And they said farther she should live, because in the beginning, they said, the woman should bring forth in pain, and wherefore they that were of this imagination affirmed how young Madden had said truth, for he had conscious to let her die. And not few and of these was young Lynch were in doubt, 
that the world was now right evil governed as it was never other howbeit the mean people believed it otherwise, but the law nor his judges did provide no remedy. A redress God grant. This was scant said, but all cried with one acclaim nay, by our virgin mother, the wife should live and the babe to die. In colour whereof they waxed hot upon that head what with argument, and what for their drinking, but the Franklin Lenehan was prompt each one to pour the mail, so that at the least way mirth might not lack. Then young Madden showed all the whole affair, and said how that she was dead, and how for holy religion's sake, by read of Palmer and Beadsman, and for a vow he had made to St. Ultan of Arbrocken, her goodman husband would not let her death, whereby they were all wondrous grieved. To whom young Stephen had these words following, Murmur, sirs, is eke oft among the lay folk. Both babe and parent now glorify their maker, the one in limbo gloom, the other in purge fire. But gramercy, what of these god possible souls that we nightly impossibilize? Which is the sin against the Holy Ghost, very God, Lord and giver of life? For, sirs, he said, our lust is brief. We are means to those small creatures within us, and nature has other ends than we. Then said Dixon, Jr., to punch Costello, wist he what ends. But he had overmuch drunken, and the best word he could have of him was that he would ever dishonest a woman whoso he were, or wife, or maid, or leman, if it so fortuned him, to be delivered of his spleen of lusty head. Whereat Crothers of Alba Longa sang young Malachi's praise, that beast the unicorn, how once in the millennium he cometh by his horn. The other all this while pricked forward with their jibes wherewith they did malice him, witnessing all and several by St. Flutinus his engines, that he was able to do any manner of thing that lay in man to do. Thereat laughed they all right jocundly, only young Stephen and Sir Leopold which never durst laugh too open by reason of a strange humour which he would not bereg, and also for that he rued for her that bare whoso she might be or wheresoever. Then spake young Stephen Orgulus of Mother Church that would cast him out of her bosom, of Law of Canons, of Lilith, patron of abortions, of bigness wrought by wind of seeds of brightness, or by potency of vampires mouth to mouth, or, as Virgilus saith, by the influence of the Occident, or by the reek of moonflower, or an she lie with a woman which her man hath but lain with, effectu secuto, or peradventure in her bath, according to the opinions of Averroes and Moses Maimonides. He also said how, at the end of the second month, a human soul was infused, and how, in all our holy mother foldeth ever souls for God's greater glory, whereas that earthly mother, which was but a dam to bear beastly, should die by canon, for so saith he that holdeth the fisherman's seal, even that blessed Peter on which rock was holy church for all ages founded. All they bachelors then asked of Sir Leopold, would he like in case so jeopard her person as risk life to save life? A weariness of mind he would answer as fit it all, and, laying hand to jaw, he said dissembling, as his wont was, that as it was informed him, who had ever loved the art of physic as might a layman, and agreeing also with his experience of so seldom seen an accident, it was good for that mother church belike at one blow had birth and death pence, and in such sort deliberately he scaped their questions. That is truth, party, said Dixon, and, or I err, a pregnant word which hearing young Stephen was a marvellous glad man, and he averred that he who stealeth from the poor lendeth to the Lord, for he was of a wild manner when he was drunken, and that he was now in that taking it appeared eftsoons. But Sir Leopold was passing grave, maugre his word, by cause he still had pity of the terror-causing shrieking of shrill women in their labour, and as he was minded of his good lady Marian that hath borne him an only man-child, which on his eleventh day on life had died, and no man of art could save so dark his destiny. And she was wondrous stricken of heart for that e evil hap, and for his burial did him on a fair corselet of lamb's wool, the flower of the flock, lest he might perish utterly and lie a-keeled, for it was then about the midst of the winter. And now Sir Leopold, that had of his body no man-child for an heir, looked upon him his friend's son, and was shut up in sorrow for his forepast happiness, and as sad as he was that him failed a son of such gentle courage, for all accounted him of real parts. So grieved he also in no less measure for young Stephen, for that he lived riotously with those wastrels, and murdered his goods with whores. About that present time young Stephen filled all cups that stood empty, so as there remained but little mo, if the prudenter had not shadowed their approach from him that still plied it very busily, who, praying for the intentions of the sovereign pontiff, he gave them for a pledge the vicar of Christ, which also, as he said, is vicar of Bray. 
Now drink we, quod he, of this mazer, and quaff ye this mead, which is not indeed parcel of my body, but my soul's bodiment. Leave ye fraction of bread to them that live by bread alone. Be not afeard, neither for any want, for this will comfort more than the other will dismay. See ye here. And he showed them two glistering coins of the tribute, and Goldsmith notes the worth of two pound nineteen shilling that he had, he said, for a song which he writ. They all admired to see the foresaid riches in such dearth of money as was here before. His words were then these as followeth. Know all men, he said, time's ruins build eternity's mansions. What means this? Desire's wind blasts the thorn tree, but after it becomes from a bramble bush to be a rose upon the root of time. Mark me now. In woman's womb word is made flesh, but in the spirit of the maker all flesh that passes becomes the word that shall not pass away. This is the post-creation. Omnis caro ad te veniet. No question but her name is Puisson, who have entried the dear course of our eigenbuyer, healer and herd, our mighty mother and mother most venerable. And Bernardus saith aptly that she hath an omnipotentiam de pare supplicem, that is to wit, an almightiness of position, because she is the second Eve, and she won us, saith Augustine too. Whereas that other, our grandam, which we are linked up with by successive anastomoses of naval cords, sold us all, seed, breed, and generation, for a penny pippin. But here is the matter now. Or she knew him, that second, I say, and was but creature of her creature, Vergine madre, filia di tuo filio. Or she knew him not, and then stands she in the one denial or ignorancy with Peter Piscator, who lives in the house that Jack built, and with Joseph the joiner, patron of the happy demise of all unhappy marriages. Parce que Emlio Taxil nous a dit que qu'il avait mise dans cette fichue position, c'était le sacre pigeon, ventre de Dieu. Entwe der transubstantiality, o der consubstantiality, but in no case subsubstantiality. And all cried out upon it for a very scurvy word. A pregnancy without joy, he said, a birth without pangs, a body without blemish, a belly without bigness. Let the lewd with faith and fervor worship. With will will we withstand, with say. Hereupon Punch Costello danged with his fist upon the board, and would sing a body catch, Stabu Stabella, about a wench that was put in pot of a jolly swashbuckler in Almany, which she did straightways now attack. The first three months she was not well, Stabu, when here Nurse Quigley from the door angrily bid them, hissed, ye should shame you. Nor was it not meet as she remembered them being. Her mind was to have all orderly against Lord Andrew came, for because she was jealous that no gasteful turmoil might shorten the honour of her guard. It was an ancient and a sad matron of a sedate look and Christian walking, in habit done beseeming her megrims and wrinkled visage, nor did her hortative want of it effect, for incontinently Punch Costello was of them all embraided, and they reclaimed the churl with civil rudeness some, and shaked him with menace of blandishments others, while they all chode with him, a murrain sees the dolt, what a devil he would be at, thou chuff, thou puny, thou got in peace straw, thou losel, thou chitterling, thou spawn of a rebel, thou dyke dropped, thou abortion thou, to shut up his drunken drool out of that like a curse of God ape, the good Sir Leopold that had for his cognizance the flower of quiet, marjorie and gentle, advising also the time's occasion as most sacred and most worthy to be most sacred. In Horn's house rest should reign. To be short, this passage was scarce by when Master Dixon of Marion Eccles, goodly grinning, asked young Stephen what was the reason why he had not sided to take friar's vows, and he answered him obedience in the womb, chastity in the tomb, but involuntary poverty all his days. Master Lenehan at this made return that he had heard of those nefarious deeds, and how, as he heard hereof counted, he had besmirched the lily virtue of a confiding female, which was corruption of minors, and they all intershowed it, too, waxing merry and toasting to his fathership. But he said very entirely it was clean, contrary to their suppose, for he was the eternal son and ever virgin. Thereat mirth grew in them the more, and they rehearsed to him his curious rite of wedlock for the disrobing and deflowering of spouses, as the priests use in Madagascar Island, she to be in guise of white and saffron, her groom in white and grain, with burning of nard and tapers on a bride-bed, while clerks sung curies and the anthem Ut novitor sexus omnes corporis mysterium, till she was there unmated. He gave them then a much admirable hymen minim by those delicate poets Master John Fletcher and Master Francis Beaumont, 
that is in their maid's tragedy that was writ for a like twining of lovers. To bed, to bed, was the burden of it, to be played with accompanable consent upon the virginals. An exquisite dulcet epithem of the most mollificative suadency for juveniles amatory, whom the odiferous flambeaux of the paranymphs have escorted to the quadrupedal proscenium of connubial communication. Well met they were, said Master Dixon, joyed, but hark ye, young sir, better were they named Bow Mount and Letcher, for, by my troth, of such a mingling much might come. Young Stephen said, indeed, to his best remembrance, they had but the one doxy between them, and she of the stews to make shift with, in delights amorous for life ran very high in those days, and the custom of the country approved with it. Greater love than this, he said, no man hath that a man lay down his wife for his friend. Go thou and do likewise. Thus, or words to that effect, saith Zarathustra, sometime regius professor of French letters to the University of Oxtail, nor breathe there ever that man to whom mankind was more beholden. Bring a stranger within thy tower, it will go hard, but thou wilt have the second best bed. Orate, fratris, pro memetipso. And all the people shall say, Amen. Remember, Aaron, thy generations and thy days of old, how little thou saidst little by me, and how by my word and broughtest in a stranger to my gates to commit fornication in my sight, and to wax fat and kick like Jeshurum. Therefore hast thou sinned against my light, and hast made me, thy lord, to be the slave of servants. Return, return, clan Milly, forget me not, O Milesian. Why hast thou done this abomination before me, that thou didst spurn me for a merchant of jalaps, and didst deny me to the Roman, and to the Indian of dark speech, with whom thy daughters did lie luxuriously? Look forth now, my people, upon the land of Behest, even from Horeb, and from Nebo, and from Pisgah, and from the horns of Hatton, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. But thou hast suckled me with a bitter milk, my moon and my sun thou hast quenched for ever, and thou hast left me alone for ever in the dark ways of my bitterness, and with a kiss of ashes hast thou kissed my mouth. This tenebrosity of the interior, he proceeded to say, hath not been illumined by the wit of the Septuagint, nor so as much mentioned for the Orient from on high, which break hell's gates visited a darkness that was foraneous. As with faction minerates atrocities, as Tully said of his darling Stoics, and Hamlet his father showeth the prince no blister of combustion. The adiaphane in the noon of life is in Egypt's plague, which in the nights of prenativity and post-mortemity is their most proper ubi and quomodo. And as the ends and ultimates of all things accord in some mean and measure with their inceptions and originals, that same multiplicit concordance which leads forth growing from birth, accomplishing by a retrogressive metamorphosis that minishing and ablation towards the final, which is agreeable unto nature, so is it with our subsolar being. The aged sisters draw us into life. We wail, batten, sport, clip, clasp, sunder, dwindle, die. Over us dead they bend. First, save from waters of old Nile, among bulrushes, a bed of fasciated wattles, at last the cavity of a mountain, an occulted sepulchre amid the conclamation of the hill-cat and the ossifrage. And as no man knows the ubicity of his tumulus, nor to what processes we shall thereby be ushered, nor whether to Tophet or to Edenville, in the like way is all hidden, when we would backward see from what region of remoteness the whatness of our whoness hath fetched his whenceness. There too Punch Costello roared out mainly, Etienne Chanson, but he loudly bid them, lo, Wisdom hath built herself a house, this vast, majestic, long-established vault, the crystal palace of the Creator, all in apple-pie order, a penny for him who finds the pea. Behold the mansion reared by Daddle Jack, see the malt stored in many a refluent sack, in the proud cirque of Jack John's bivouac. A black crack of noise in the street here, a lack bawled back. Loud on the left Thor thundered, in anger awful the hammer hurler. Came now the storm that hissed his heart and Master Lynch bade him have a care to flout and wit wanton as the god's self was angered for his hellprate and paganry. And he that had erst challenged to be so doughy waxed wane as they might all mark and shrank together, and his pitch that was before so hot uplift was now of a sudden quite plucked down, and his heart shook within the cage of his breast as he tasted the rumour of that storm. Then did some mock and some jeer, and Punch Costello fell hard again to his yell, which Master Lanahan vowed he would do after and he was indeed but a word and a blow on any the least colour. But the braggart boaster cried that an old noble daddy was in his cups, it was much what indifferent, and he would not lag behind his lead. 
but this was only to die his desperation as cowed he crouched in Horn's Hall. He drank indeed at one draught to pluck up a heart of any grace, for it thundered long rumblingly over all the heavens, so that Master Madden, being godly certain whiles, knocked him on his ribs upon that crack of doom, and Master Bloom, at the braggart's side, spoke to him calming words to slumber his great fear, advertising how it was no other thing but a hubbub noise that he heard, the discharge of fluids from the thunderhead, look you, having taken place, and all of the order of a natural phenomenon. But was young Boasthard's fear vanquished by Calmer's words? No, for he had in his bosom a spike named bitterness, which could not by words be done away. And was he then neither calm like the one, nor godly like the other? He was neither as much as he would have liked to be either. But could he not have endeavoured to have found again, as in his youth, the bottle holiness that then he lived withal? Indeed, no, for Grace was not there to find that bottle. Heard he then in that clap the voice of the god bring forth, or, what Calmer said, a hubbub of phenomenon, heard? Why, he could not but hear, unless he had plugged him up the tube understanding, which he had not done. For through that tube he saw that he was in the land of phenomenon, where he must for a certain one day die, as he was like the rest too, a passing show. And would he not accept to die like the rest and pass away? By no means would he, though he must, nor would he make more shows according as men do with wives, which phenomenon has commanded them to do by the book law. Then wotted he not of that other land which is called Believe on Me, that is the land of promise which behoves to the king delightful, and shall be for ever where there is no death and no birth, neither wiving nor mothering, at which all shall come as many as believe on it. Yes, Pius had told him of that land, and Chaste had pointed him to the way, but the reason was that in the way he fell in with a certain whore of an eye-pleasing exterior, whose name, she said, is Bird in the Hand, and she beguiled him wrongways from the true path by her flatteries that she said to him as, Ho, oh, you pretty man, turn aside hither and I will show you a brave place, and she lay at him so flatteringly that she had him in her grot, which is named Two in the Bush, or, by some learned, Carnal Concupiscence. This was it what all that company that sat there at commons in manse of mothers the most lusted after, and if they met with this horror bird in the hand, which was within all foul plagues, monsters, and a wicked devil, they would strain the last, but they would make at her and know her. For regarding believe on me, they said, it was not else but notion, and they could conceive no thought of it, for, first, two in the bush, whither she ticed them, was the very goodliest grot, and in it were four pillows, on which were four tickets, with these words printed on them, pick-a-back, and topsy-turvy, and shame-face, and cheek-by-jowl, and, second, for that foul plague all pox and the monsters they cared not for them, for preservative had given them a stout shield of oxen-gut, and, third, that they might take no hurt at neither from offspring that was that wicked devil by virtue of this same shield, which was named Killchild. So were they all in their blind fancy, Mr. Cavill and Mr. Sometimes Godly, Mr. Ape Swillel, Mr. False Franklin, Mr. Dainty Dixon, Young Boastard, and Mr. Cautious Calmer. Wherein, O wretched company, were ye all deceived, for that was the voice of the God that was in a very grievous rage, that he would presently lift his arm up and spill their souls for their abuses, and their spillings done by them contrarywise to his word, which forth to bring Brenigly biddeth. So, Thursday, 16th of June, Patrick Dinham lay in a clay of an apoplexy, and after a hard drought, please God, rain. A bargeman coming in by water, a fifty mile or thereabout, with turf saying the seed won't sprout, fields athirst, very sad coloured and stunk mightily, the quags and tofts too. Hard to breathe, and all the young quicks clean consumed without sprinkle this long while back, as no man remembered to be without. The rosy buds all gone brown and spread out blobs, and on the hills naught but dry flag and faggots that would catch at first fire. All the world saying, for aught they knew, the big wind of last February a year that did havoc the land so pitifully a small thing beside this barrenness. But by and by, as said, this evening after sundown, the wind sitting in the west, biggish swollen clouds to be seen as the night increased, and the weather-wise pouring up at them, and some sheet lightnings at first and after, past ten of the clock, one great stroke with a long thunder, and an abrace of shakes all scamper pell-mell within door for the smoking shower, the men making shelter for their straws with a clout or kerchief, women folks skipping off with kirtles catched up soon as the poor came. 
in Eli Place, Baggett Street, Duke's Lawn, thence through Marion Green up to Hollis Street, a swash of water flowing that was before bone dry, and not one chair or coach or fire could seen about, but no more crack after that first. Over against the right honourable Mr. Justice Fitzgibbon's door, that is to sit with Mr. Healy the lawyer upon the college lands, Mal Mulligan, a gentleman's gentleman, that had but come from Mr. Moore's, the writer's, that was a papish, but is now, folks say, a good Willamite, chanced against Alec Bannon in a cut bob, which are now in with dance cloaks of Kendall Green, that was new got to town from Mullingar, with the stage where his cousin and Mal M.'s brother will stay a month, yet till St. Swithin, and asks, what in the earth he does there? He bound home, and he to St. Andrew Horns, being stayed for to crush a cup of wine, so he said, but would tell him of a skittish heifer, big of her age, and beef to the heel, and all this while poured with rain, and so both together on to horns. There Leop Bloom, of Crawford's journal, sitting snug with a covey of wags, likely brangling fellows, Dixon, Jr., scholar of My Lady of Mercies, Vin Lynch, a Scots fellow, Will Madden, T. Lenahan, very sad about a racer, he fancied, and Stephen D. Leop Bloom, therefore a languor he had, but was now better, be, be having dreamed to-night a strange fancy of his dame Mrs. Mull with red slippers on, in a pair of turkey trunks, which is thought by those in ken to be for a change. And Mrs. Just Purefoy there, that got in through pleading her belly, and now on the stools, poor body, two days past her term. The midwives sore put to it and can't deliver, she queasy for a bowl of rice slop that is a shrewd dryer up of the insides, and her breath very heavy, more than good, and should be a bully boy from the knocks, they say, but God give her soon issue. Tis her ninth chick to live, I hear, and Lady Day bit off her last chick's nails that was then a twelve-month, and with other three all breastfed that died written out in a fair hand in the king's Bible. Her hub fifty-odd and a Methodist, but takes the sacrament, and is to be seen any fair Sabbath with a pair of his boys off Bullock Harbor, dappling on the sound with a heavy-braked reel, or in a punt he has for trailing for flounder and pollock, and catches a fine bag, I hear. In sum, an infinite great fall of rain, and all refreshed, and will much increase the harvest, yet those in Ken say, after wind and water, fire shall come for a prognostication of Malachi's almanac. And I hear that Mr. Russell has done a prophetical charm of the same gist out of the Hindustanish for his farmer's gazette. To have three things in all, but this a mere fetch without bottom of reason for old cronies and barons yet, sometime they are found in the right guest with their queerities, no telling how. With this came up Lenahan to the feet of the table, to say how the letter was in that night's gazette, and he made a show to find it about him, for he swore with an oath that he had been at pains about it. But on Stephen's persuasion he gave over the search, and was bidden to sit near by which he did mighty brisk. He was a kind of sport gentleman that went for a merry andrew or honest pickle, and what belonged of women, horse-flesh, or hot scandal he had it pat. To tell the truth he was mean in fortunes, and for the most part hankered about the coffee-houses and low taverns with crimps, ostlers, bookies, hallsmen, runners, flat-caps, waistcoatiers, ladies of the bagno, and other rogues of the game, or with a chanceable catch-pole or a tip-staff, often at nights till broad day, of whom he picked up between his sack-possets much loose gossip. He took his ordinarily at a boiling cook's, and if he had but gotten him into a mess of broken victuals or a platter of tripes with a bare tester in his purse, he could always bring himself off with his tongue, some randy quip he had from a punk or what not that every mother's son of them would burst their sides. The other, Costello, that is, hearing this talk, asked, was it poetry or a tale? Faith no, he says, Frank, that was his name, tis all about carry cows that are about to be butchered along of the plague. But they can go hang, says he with a wink, for me with their bully beef, a pox on it. There's as good fish in this tin as ever came out of it, and very friendly he offered to take of some salty sprats that stood by, which he had eyed wisely in the meantime, and found the place which was indeed the chief design of his embassy, as he was sharp set. Mar de vache, says Frank, then in the French language, that had been indentured to a brandy shipper that has a wine lodge in Bordeaux, and he spoke French like a gentleman, too. From a child this Frank had been a do-not, that his father, a headborough, who could ill keep him to school to learn his letters and the use of the globes, matriculated at the university to study the mechanics, but he took the bit between his teeth like a raw colt, and was more familiar with the justiciary and the parish beetle than with his volumes. One time he would be a play-actor, then a sutler or a welsher, then naught would keep him from the bear-pit and the cocking-mane, 
Then he was for the ocean sea, or to hoof it on the roads with the Romany folk, kidnapping a squire's heir by favour of moonlight, or fecking maid's linen, or choking chicken behind a hedge. He had been off as many times as a cat has lives, and back again with naked pockets as many more, to his father the headborough who shed a pint of tears as often as he saw him. What, says Mr. Leopold, with his hands across, that was earnest to know the drift of it, will they slaughter all? I protest I saw them but this day morning going to the Liverpool boats, says he. I can scarce believe tis so bad, says he. And he had experience of the like, brood beasts, and of springers, greasy hoggets, and weather wool, having been some years before actuary for Mr. Joseph Cuff, a worthy salesmaster that drove his trade for livestock and meadow auctions hard by Mr. Gavin Lowe's yard in Prussia Street. I question with you there, says he. More like tis the hoose or the timber tongue. Mr. Stephen, a little moved, but very handsomely told him no such matter, and that he had dispatches from the Emperor's chief tail-tickler, thanking him for the hospitality, that was sending over Dr. Rinderpest, the best-quoted cow-catcher in all Muscovy, with a bolus or two of physic to take the bull by the horns. Come, come, says Mr. Vincent, plain dealing. He'll find himself on the horns of a dilemma if he meddles with a bull that's Irish, says he. Irish by name and Irish by nature, says Mr. Stephen, and he sent the ale purling about, an Irish bull in an English china shop. I conceive you, says Mr. Dixon. It is that same bull that was sent to our island by Farmer Nicholas, the bravest cattle breeder of them all, with an emerald ring in his nose. True for you, says Mr. Vincent, across the table, and a bull's eye into the bargain, says he, and a plumper and portlier bull, says he, never shit on a shamrock. He had horns galore, a coat of cloth of gold, and a sweet smoky breath coming out of his nostrils, so that the women of our island, leaving dough balls and rolling pins, followed after him, hanging his bulliness in daisy chains. What for that, says Mr. Dixon, but before he came over, Farmer Nicholas, that was a eunuch, had him properly gelded by a college of doctors, who were no better off than himself. So be off now, says he, and do all my cousin German, the Lord Harry tells you, and take a farmer's blessing, and with that he slapped his posteriors very soundly. But the slap and the blessing stood him friend, says Mr. Vincent, for to make up he taught him a trick worth two of the other, so that the maid, wife, abbess, and widow to this day affirm that they would rather any time of the month whisper in his ear in the dark of a cow-house, or get a lick on the nape from his long holy tongue, than lie with the finest strapping young ravisher in the four fields of all Ireland. Another then put in his word. And they dressed him, says he, in a point shift and petticoat, with a tippet and girdle, and ruffles on his wrists, and clipped his forelock and rubbed him all over with a spermacetic oil, and built stables for him at every turn of the road, with a gold manger in each, full of the best hay in the market, so that he could doss and dung to his heart's content. By this time the father of the faithful, for so they called him, was grown so heavy that he could scarce walk to pasture to remedy which our cousining dames and damsels brought him his fodder from their apron laps, and as soon as his belly was full he would rear up on his hind quarters to show their ladyships a mystery, and roar and bellow out of him in bull's language, and they all after him. Ay, says another, and so pampered was he that he would suffer not to grow in all the land but green grass for himself, for that was the only colour to his mind. And there was a board put up on a hillock in the middle of the island with a printed notice saying, By the Lord Harry! Green is the grass that grows on the ground. And, says Mr. Dixon, if he ever got scent of a cattle raider in Roscommon, or in the wilds of Conmara, or a husbandsman in Sligo that was sowing as much as a handful of mustard, or a bag of rapeseed out, he'd run amok over half the countryside, rooting up with his horns whatever was planted, and all by Lord Harry's orders. There had been bad blood between them at first, says Mr. Vincent, and the Lord Harry called Farmer Nicholas all the old Nicks in the world, and an old whoremaster that kept seven trolls in his house, and I'll meddle in his manners, says he. I'll make that animal smell hell, says he, with the help of that good pizzle my father left me. But one evening, says Mr. Dixon, when the Lord Harry was cleaning his royal pelt to go to dinner after winning a boat race, he had spade oars for himself, but the first rule of the course was that the others were to row with pitchforks. He discovered in himself a wonderful likeness to a bull, and on picking up a black-thumbed chapbook that he kept in the pantry, he found, sure enough, that he was a left-handed descendant of the famous champion bull of the Romans, Boss Bovum, which is good bog Latin for boss of the show. After that, says Mr. Vincent, the Lord Harry put his head into a cow's drinking trough in the presence of all his courtiers, and, pulling it out again, told them all his new name. Then, with the water running off him, he got into an old smock and skirt that had belonged to his grandmother, 
and bought a grammar of the bull's language to study, but he could never learn a word of it except the first personal pronoun which he copied out big and got off by heart, and if ever he went out for a walk he filled his pockets with chalk to write it upon what took his fancy, the side of a rock or a tea-house table or a bale of cotton or a cork float. In short, he and the bull of Ireland were soon as fast friends as an arse in a shirt. They were, says Mr. Stephen, and the end was that the men of the island, seeing no help was toward, as the ungrate woman were all of one mind, made a wary raft, loaded themselves and their bundles of chattels on shipboard, set all masts erect, manned the yards, sprang their luff, heaved to, spread three sheets in the wind, put her head between wind and water, weighed anchor, ported her helm, ran up the Jolly Roger, gave three times three, let the bulljine run, pushed off in their bumboat and put to sea to recover the main of America. Which was the occasion, says Mr. Vincent, of the composing by a bosun of that rollicking chanty. Peter Pope's but a piss a bed, a man's a man for all that. Our worthy acquaintance, Mr. Malachi Mulligan, now appeared in the doorway as the students were finishing their apologue, accompanied with a friend whom he had just encountered, a young gentleman, his name Alec Bannon, who had late come to town, it being his intention to buy a colour or a cornetcy in the fencibles and list for the wars. Mr. Mulligan was civil enough to express some relish of it all the more as it jumped with a project of his own for the cure of the very evil that had been touched on. Whereat he handed round to the company a set of pasteboard cards which he had had printed that day at Mr. Quinnell's, bearing a legend printed in fair italics. Mr. Malachi Mulligan, Fertilizer and Incubator, Lambay Island. His project, as he went on to expound, was to withdraw from the round of idle pleasures such as formed the chief business of Sir Fopling Poppinjay and Sir Milksop Quidnunc in town, and to devote himself to the noblest task for which our bodily organism has been framed. "'Well, let us hear of it, good my friend,' said Mr. Dixon. "'I make no doubt it smacks of wenching. Come, be seated, both.' "'Tis as cheap sitting as standing.' Mr. Mulligan accepted of the invitation, and, expatiating upon his design, told his hearers that he had been led into this thought by a consideration of the causes of sterility, both the inhibitory and the prohibitory, whether the inhibition in its turn were due to conjugal vexations or to a parsimony of the balance, as well as whether the prohibition proceeded from defects congenital or from proclivities acquired. It grieved him plaguily, he said, to see the nuptial couch defrauded of its dearest pleasures and to reflect upon so many agreeable females with rich jointures, a prey to the vilest bonzes, who hide their flambeau under a bushel in an uncongenial cloister, or lose their womanly bloom in the embraces of some unaccountable muskin when they might multiply the inlets of happiness, sacrificing the inestimable jewel of their sex when a hundred pretty fellows were at hand to caress. This, he assured them, made his heart weep. To curb this inconvenient, which he concluded due to a suppression of a latent heat, Having advised with certain counsellors of worth and inspected into the matter, he had resolved to purchase in fee simple forever the freehold of Lambay Island from its holder, Lord Talbot de Malahide, a Tory gentleman of note much in favour with our ascendancy party. He proposed to set up there a national fertilising farm to be named Omphalos, with an obelisk hewn and erected after the fashion of Egypt, and to offer his dutiful yeoman services for the fecundation of any female of what grade of life soever who should there direct to him with the desire of fulfilling the functions of her natural. Money was no object, he said, nor would he take a penny for his pains. The poorest kitchen wench no less than the opulent lady of fashion, if so be their constructions and their tempers were warm persuaders for their positions, would find in him their man. For his nutriment he shewed how he would feed himself exclusively upon a diet of savoury tubercles and fish and conies there, the flesh of these latter prolific rodents being highly recommended for his purpose, both broiled and stewed with a blade of mace and a pot or two of capsicum chilies. After this homily, which he delivered with much warmth of asseveration, Mr. Mulligan in a trice put off from his hat a kerchief with which he had shielded it. They both, it seems, had been overtaken by the rain, and for all their mending their pace had taken water as might be observed by Mr. Mulligan's small clothes of a hodden grey, which was now somewhat piebald. His project, meanwhile, was very favourably entertained by his auditors, and won hearty eulogies from all, though Mr. Dixon of Mary's accepted to it, asking with a finicking air did he purpose also to carry coals to Newcastle. Mr. Mulligan, however, made court to the scholarly by an apt quotation from the classics, which, as it dwelt upon his memory, seemed to him a sound and tasteful support of his contention. Talis actanta depravatio huius scapuli, 
o quirtes ut matres familiarum nostre lascivias, cuius libet semiviri libici, titillaciones, testibus ponderosis atque excelsius erectionibus, centurionem romanorum magnopere antepunit. While for those of ruder wit he drove home his point by analogies of the animal kingdom more suitable to their stomach, the buck and doe of the forest glades, the farmyard drake and duck. Valuing himself not a little upon his elegance, being indeed a proper man of person, this talkative now applied himself to his dress with animadversions of some heat upon the sudden whimsy of the atmospherics, while the company lavished their encomiums upon the project he had advanced. The young gentleman, his friend, overjoyed as he was at a passage that had late befallen him, could not forbear to tell it his nearest neighbour. Mr. Mulligan, now perceiving the table, asked for whom were these loaves and fishes, and— Seeing the stranger, he made him a civil bow, and said, Pray, sir, was you in need of any professional assistance we could give? Who, upon his offer, thanked him very heartily, though preserving his proper distance, and replied that he was come there about a lady, now an inmate of Horn's house, that was in an interesting condition, poor body, from a woman's woe. And here he fetched a deep sigh, to know if her happiness had yet taken place. Mr. Dixon, to turn the table, took on to ask of Mr. Mulligan himself whether his incipient ventripotence, upon which he rallied him, betokened an ovoblastic gestation in the prostatic utricle or, or male womb, or was due, and with the noted physician, Mr. Austin Meldon, to a wolf in the stomach. For answer, Mr. Mulligan, in a gale of laughter at his smalls, smote himself bravely below the diaphragm, exclaiming with an admirable droll mimic of Mother Grogan, the most excellent creature of her sex, though tis a pity she's a trollop, there is a belly that never bore a bastard. This was so happy a conceit that it renewed the storm of mirth and threw the whole room into the most violent agitations of delight. The spry rattle had run on in the same vein of mimicry but for some larum in the antechamber. Here the listener, who was none other than the Scotch student, a little fume of a fellow, blond as tow, congratulated in the liveliest fashion with the young gentleman, and, interrupting the narrative at a salient point, having desired his vis-a-vis -vis with a polite beck to have the obligingness to place him a flagon of cordial waters at the same time by a questioning poise of the head. A whole century of polite breeding had not achieved so nice a gesture. To which was united an equivalent but contrary balance of the bottle, asked the narrator, as plainly as was ever done in words, if he might treat him with a cup of it. Mais bien sûr, noble stranger, said he cheerily, et mille compliments, that you may, and very opportunely, there wanted nothing but this cup to crown my felicity. But, gracious heavens, was I left with but a crust in my wallet and a cupful of water from the well, my God, I would accept of them and find it in my heart to kneel down upon the ground and give thanks to the powers above for the happiness vouchsafed me by the giver of good things. With these words he approached the goblet to his lips, took a complacent draught of the cordial, slicked his hair, and, opening his bosom, out popped a locket that hung from a silk ribbon, that very picture which she had cherished ever since her hand had wrote therein. Ah, monsieur, he said, had you but beheld her as I did with these eyes at that affecting instant with her dainty tucker and her new coquette cap, a gift for her feast day, as she told me prettily, in such an artless disorder, of so melting a tenderness, upon my conscience, even you, monsieur, had been impelled by generous nature to deliver yourself wholly into the hands of such an enemy, or to quit the field forever. I declare I was never so touched in all my life, God, I thank thee, as the author of my days. Thrice happy will he be whom so amiable a creature will bless with her favours. A sigh of affection gave eloquence to these words, and, having replaced the locket in his bosom, he wiped his eye and sighed again. Beneficent disseminators of blessings to all thy creatures, how great and universal must be that sweetest of thy tyrannies, which can hold in thrall the free and the bond, the simple swain and the polished coxcomb the lover in the heyday of reckless passion and the husband of maturer years. But indeed, sir, I wander from the point. How mingled and imperfect are all our sublunary joys! Maledicity! he exclaimed in anguish. Would to God that foresight had but remembered me to take my cloak along! I could weep to think of it. Then, though it had poured seven showers, we were neither of us a penny the worse. But beshrew me, he cried, clapping hand to his forehead, to-morrow will be a new day, and thousand thunders, I know of a marchand de capote, Monsieur Points, for whom I can have for a livre as snug a cloak of the French fashion as ever kept a lady from wedding. Tut, tut, cries le fecondateur, tripping in. My friend Mr. Moore, that most accomplished traveller, 
I have just cracked a half-bottle avec lui in a circle of the best wits in town, is my authority that in Cape Horn, ventre biche, they have a rain that will wet through any, even the stoutest cloak. A drenching of that violence, he tells me, sans blague, has sent more than one luckless fellow in good earnest post-haste to another world. Pooh, a livre, cries Monsieur Lynch. The clumsy things are dear at a sou. One umbrella, were it no bigger than a fairy mushroom, is worth ten such stopgaps. No woman of any wit would wear one. My dear Kitty told me today that she would dance in a deluge before ever she would starve in such an ark of salvation for, as she reminded me, blushing piquantly and whispering in my ear, though there was none to snap her words but giddy butterflies, Dame Nature, by the divine blessing, has implanted it in our hearts and has become a household word that il y a deux choses for which the innocence of our original garb, in other circumstances a breach of the proprieties, is the fittest, nay, the only garment. The first, said she, and here my pretty philosopher, as I handed her to her tilbury to fix my attention, gently tipped with her tongue the outer chamber of my ear, the first is a bath. But at this point a bell tinkling in the hall cut short a discourse which promised so bravely for the enrichment of our store of knowledge. Amid the general vacant hilarity of the assembly a bell rang, and, while all were conjecturing what might be the cause, Miss Callan entered, and, having spoken a few words in a low tone to young Mr. Dixon, retired with a profound bow to the company. The presence even for a moment among a party of debauchees of a woman, endued with every quality of modesty, and not less severe than beautiful, restrained the humorous sallies even of the most licentious, but her departure was the signal for an outbreak of ribaldry. "'Strike me silly,' said Costello, a low fellow who was fuddled. "'A monstrous fine bit of cow flesh. I'll be sworn she has rendezvoused you. "'What, you dog? Have you away with them? Gad's bud, immensely so,' said Mr. Lynch. "'The bedside manner it is that they use in the modern hospice.' Dem, does not Dr. O'Glargle chuck the nuns there under the chin? As I looked to be saved, I had it from my kitty, who has been ward-maid there any time these seven months. Locks a mercy, doctor, cried the young blood in the primrose vest, feigning a womanish simper and with immodest squirmings of his body. How you do tease a body! Drat the man! Bless me, I'm all of a wibbly-wobbly. Why, you're as bad as dear little father can't kiss him, that you are. May this pot of four half choke me, cried Costello, if she ain't in the family way. I knows a lady what's got a white swelling, quick as I clap eyes on her. The young surgeon, however, rose and begged the company to excuse his retreat, as the nurse had just then informed him that he was needed in the ward. Merciful Providence had been pleased to put a period to the sufferings of the lady who was enciente, which she had borne with a laudable fortitude, and she had given birth to a bouncing boy. I want patience, said he, with those who, without wit to enliven or learning to instruct, revile an ennobling profession which— saving the reverence due to the deity, is the greatest power for happiness upon the earth. I am positive when I say that if need were I could produce a cloud of witnesses to the excellence of her noble exercitations, which, far from being a byword, should be a glorious incentive in the human breast. I cannot away with them. What? Malign such a one, the amiable Miss Callan, who is the luster of her own sex and the astonishment of others, and at an instant the most momentous that can befall a puny child of clay? Perish the thought. I shudder to think of the future of a race where the seeds of such malice have been sown, and where no right reverence is rendered to mother and maid in House of Horn. Having delivered himself of this rebuke, he saluted those present on the by, and repaired to the door. A murmur of approval arose from all, and some were for ejecting the low soaker without more ado, a design which would have been effected, nor would he have received more than his bare deserts, had he not abridged his transgression by affirming with a horrid imprecation, for he swore a round hand, that he was as good a son of the true fold as ever drew breath. Stap my vitals, said he, them was always the sentiments of honest Frank Costello, which I was bred up most particular to honour thy father and thy mother, that had the best hand to a roly-poly or a hasty pudding as you ever see, what I always looks back on with a loving heart. End of section 14a Ulysses, section 14b. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. To revert to Mr. Bloom, who, after his first entry, had been conscious of some impudent mocks which he, however, had borne with as being the fruits of that age upon which it is commonly charged that it knows not pity. 
The young sparks, it is true, were as full of extravagancies as overgrown children. The words of their tumultuary discussions were difficultly understood, and not often nice. Their testiness and outrageous mo were such that his intellects resiled from. Nor were they scrupulously sensible of the properties through their fund of strong animal spirits spoke in their behalf. But the word of Mr. Costello was an unwelcome language for him, for he nauseated the wretch that seemed to him a crop-eared creature of misshapen gibberosity, born out of wedlock, and thrust like a crookback, toothed and feet first into the world, which the dint of the surgeon's pliers in his skull lent indeed a color to, so as to put him in thought of that missing link of creation's chain desiderated by the late ingenious Mr. Darwin. It was now for more than the middle span of our allotted years that he had passed through the thousand vicissitudes of existence, and, being of a wary ascendancy, and self a man of rare forecast, he had enjoined his heart to repress all motions of a rising collar, and, by intercepting them with readiest precaution, foster within his breast that plenitude of sufferance which base minds jeer at, rash judgers scorn, and all find tolerable and but tolerable. To those who create themselves wits at the cost of feminine delicacy, a habit of mind which he never did hold with, to them he would concede neither to bear the name nor to herit the tra tradition of a proper breeding, while for such that, having lost all forbearance, can lose no more, there remained the sharp antidote of experience to cause their insolency to beat a precipitate and inglorious retreat. Not but what he could feel with meddlesome youth which, caring not for the mouths of dotards or the gruntlings of the severe, is ever, as the chaste fancy of the holy writer expresses it, for eating of the tree forbid it yet not so far forth as to pretermit humanity upon any condition soever towards a gentlewoman when she was about her lawful occasions. To conclude, while from the sister's words he had reckoned upon a speedy delivery, he was, however, it must be owned, not a little alleviated by the intelligence that the issue so auspicated after an ordeal of such duress now testified once more to the mercy as well as to the bounty of the supreme being. Accordingly, he broke his mind to his neighbor, saying that, to express his notion of the thing, his opinion, who ought not perchance to express one, was that one must have a cold constitution and a frigid genius not to be rejoiced by this freshest news of the fruition of her confinements, since she had been in such pain through no fault of hers. The dressy young blade said it was her husband's that put her in that expectation, or at least it ought to be, unless she were another Ephesian matron. I must acquaint you, said Mr. Crothers, clapping on the table so as to evoke a resonant comment of emphasis, old glory alleluia room was round again to-day an elderly man with dundrearies, preferring through his nose a request to have a word of Wilhelmina, my life, as he calls her. I bade him hold himself in readiness, for that the event would burst anon. Slife, I'll be round with you. I cannot but extol the virile potency of the old bucko that could still knock another child out of her. All fell to praising of it, each after his own fashion, though the same young blade held with his former view that another than her conjugial had been the man in the gap, a clerk in orders, a link-boy, virtuous, or an itinerant vendor of articles needed in every household. Singular, communed the guest with himself, the wonderfully unequal faculty of metempsychosis possessed by them, that the puerperal dormitory and the dissecting theatre should be the seminaries of such frivolity, that the mere acquisition of academic titles should suffice to transform in a pinch of time these votaries of levity into exemplary practitioners of an art which most men, anywise eminent, have esteemed the noblest. But, he further added, it is mayhap to relieve the pent-up feelings that in common oppress them, for I have observed more than once that birds of a feather laugh together. But with what fitness, let it be asked of the noble lord, his patron, has this alien, whom the concession of a gracious prince has admitted to civic rights, constituted himself the lord paramount of our internal polity? Where is now the gratitude which loyalty should have counselled? During the recent war, whenever the enemy had a temporary advantage with his granados, did this traitor to his kind not seize the moment to discharge his peace against the empire of which he is a tenant at will, while he trembled for the security of his four percents? Has he forgotten this, as he forgets all benefits received? Or is it that from being a deluder of others he has become at last his own dupe, as he is, if report belie him not, his own and his only enjoyer? Far be it from candor to violate the bedchamber of a respectable lady the daughter of a gallant major, or to cast the most distant reflections upon her virtue, but if he challenges attention there, as it was indeed highly his interest not to have done, then it be so. 
unhappy woman. She has been too long and too persistently denied her legitimate prerogative to listen to his objurgations with any other feeling than the derision of the desperate. He says this, a censor of morals, a very pelican in his piety, who did not scruple, oblivious of the ties of nature, to attempt illicit intercourse with a female domestic drawn from the lowest strata of society. Nay, had the hussy's scouring brush not been her tutelary angel, if it had gone with her as hard as with Hagar, the Egyptian. In the question of the grazing lands his peevish asperity is notorious, and in Mr. Cuff's hearing brought upon him from an indig indignant rancher a scathing retort, couched in terms as straightforward as they were bucolic. It ill becomes him to preach that gospel. Has he not nearer home a seed-field that lies fallow for the want of a plowshare? A habit reprehensible at puberty is second nature and an opprobrium in middle life. If he must dispense his balm of Gilead in nostrums and apothegms of dubious taste to restore to health a generation of unfledged profligates, let his practice consist better with the doctrines that now engross him. His marital breast is the repository of secrets which decorum is reluctant to adduce. The lewd suggestions of some faded beauty may console him for a consort neglected and debauched, but this new exponent of morals and healers of ills is at his best an exotic tree which, when rooted in its native orient, throve and flourished and was abundant in balm, but, transplanted to a clime more temperate, its roosts have lost their quondam vigor, while the stuff that comes away from it is stagnant, acid, and inoperative. The news was imparted with a circumspection recalling the ceremonial usage of the sublime port by the second female infirmarian to the junior medical officer in residence, who in his turn announced to the delegation that an heir had been born. When he had betaken himself to the woman's apartment to assist at the prescribed ceremony of the afterbirth, in the presence of the Secretary of State for Domestic Affairs and the members of the Privy Council, silent in unanimous exhaustion and approbation the delegates, chafing under the length and solemnity of their vigil, and hoping that the joyful occurrence would palliate a license which the simultaneous absence of Abigail and obstetrician rendered the easiest, broke out at once into a strife of tongues. In vain the voice of Mr. Canvasser Bloom was heard endeavouring to urge, to mollify, to refrain. The moment was too propitious for the display of that discursiveness which seemed the only bond of union among tempers so divergent. Every phase of the situation was successfully eviscerated. The prenatal repugnance of uterine brothers, the caesarean section, posthumity with respect to the father and, that rarer form, with respect to the mother, the fratricidal case known as the child's murder and rendered memorable by the impassioned plea of Mr. Advocate Bush, which secured the acquittal of the wrongfully accused, the rights of primogeniture and king's bounty touching twins and triplets, miscarriages and infanticides, simulated or dissimulated, the acardiac fetus in fetu and a prosopia due to a congestion, the agnathia of certain chinless Chinamen, cited by Mr. Candidate Mulligan, in consequence of defective reunion of the maxillary knobs along the medial line so that, as he said, one ear could hear what the other spoke, the benefits of anesthesia or twilight sleep, the prolongation of labor pains in advanced gravidity by region of pressure on the vein, the premature relentment of the amniotic fluid, as exemplified in the actual case, with consequent peril of sepsis to the matrix, artificial insemination by means of syringes, involution of the womb consequent upon menopause, the problem of the perpetration of the species in the case of females impregnated by delinquent rape, that distressing manner of deliber delivery called by the Brandenburgers Sturzgewirt, the recorded instances of multiseminal, twi-kindled, and monstrous births conceived during the catamenic period, or of consanguinous parents, in a word, all the cases of human nativity which Aristotle has classified in his masterpiece, with chromolithographic illustrations. The gravest problems of obstetrics and forensic medicine were examined with as much animation as the most popular beliefs on the state of pregnancy, such as forbidding to a gravid woman to step over a country style, lest, by her movement, the navel cord should strangle her creature, and the injunction upon her in the event of a yearning, ardently and ineffectually entertained, to place her hand against that part of her person which long usage has consecrated as the seat of castigation. The abnormalities of hair lip, breast mole, supernumerary digits, Negro's inkle, strawberry mark, and port wine stain were alleged by one as a prima facie and natural hypothetical explanation of those swine-headed, the case of Madame Gristle Stevens was not forgotten, or dog-haired infants occasionally born. The hypothesis of a plasmic memory, advanced by the Caledonian envoy, and worthy of the metaphysical traditions of the land he stood for, 
envisioned in such cases an arrest of embryonic development at some stage antecedent to the human. An outlandish delegate sustained against both these views, with such heat as almost carried conviction, the theory of copulation between women and the males of brutes, his authority being his own avouchment in support of fables, such as that of the Minotaur, which the genius of the elegant Latin poet has handed down to us in the pages of his Metamorphoses. The impression made by his words was immediate but short-lived. It was effaced as easily as it had been evoked by an allocution from Mr. Candidate Mulligan, in that vein of pleasantry which none better knew than he how to effect, postulating as the supremest object of desire a nice clean old man. Contemporaneously, a heated argument having arisen between Mr. Delegate Madden and Mr. Candidate Lynch regarding the juridical and theological dilemma created in the event of one Siamese twin predeceasing the other, the difficulty by mutual consent was referred to Mr. Canvasser Bloom for instant submittal to Mr. Coadjutor Deacon Dedalus. Hitherto silent, whether the better to show by preternatural gravity that curious dignity of the garb which with he was invested or in obedience to an inward voice, he delivered briefly and, some thought, perfunctorily the ecclesiastical ordinance forbidding man to put asunder what God has joined. But Malachias's tale began to freeze them with horror. He conjured up the scene before them. The secret panel beside the chimney slid back and in the recess appeared, Haines! Which of us did not feel his flesh creep? He had a portfolio full of Celtic literature in one hand, in the other a file marked Poison. Surprise, horror, loathing were depicted on all faces while he eyed them with a ghostly grin. I anticipated some such reception, he began with an eldritch laugh, for which, it seems, history is to blame. Yes, it is true. I am the murderer of Samuel Childs. And how I am punished. The inferno has no terrors for me. This is the appearance is on me. Tear and ages, what way would I be resting at all, he muttered thickly and I tramping Dublin this while back with my share of songs and himself after me like the Soth or a Bolawaris. My hell, and Ireland's, is in this life. It is what I tried to obliterate my crime. Distractions, rook-shooting, the heiress language, he recited some, laudanum, he raised the vial to his lips, camping out, in vain, his spectre stalks me. Dope is my only hope. Ah, destruction, the Black Panther! With a cry he suddenly vanished and the panel slid back. An instant later his head appeared in the door opposite and said, Meet me at Westland Row Station at ten past eleven. He was gone. Tears gushed from the eyes of the dissipated host. The seer raised his hand to heaven, murmuring, The vendetta of Mananon, the sage repeated, Lex Talionis. The sentimentalist is he who would enjoy without incurring the immense debtorship for a thing done. Malachias, overcome by emotion, ceased. The mystery was unveiled. Haines was the third brother. His real name was Child. The Black Panther was himself the ghost of his own father. He drank drugs to obliterate. For this relief, much thanks. The lonely house by the graveyard is uninhabited. No soul will live there. The spider pitches her web in the solitude. The nocturnal rat peers from his hole. A curse is on it. It is haunted. Murderer's ground. What is the age of the soul of man? As she hath the virtue of the chameleon to change her hue at every new approach, to be gay with the merry and mournful with the downcast, so too is her age changeable as her mood. No longer is Leopold, as he sits there, ruminating, chewing the cud of reminiscence, that staid agent of publicity and holder of a modest substance and funds. A score of years are blown away. He is young Leopold. There, as in a retrospective arrangement, a mirror within a mirror, hey, presto, he beholdeth himself. That young figure of then is seen, precociously manly, walking on a nipping morning from the old house in Clanbrassel Street to the high school, his book satchel on him bandolier-wise, and in it a goodly hunk of wheaten loaf, a mother's thought. Or it is that same figure, a year or so gone over, in his first hard hat, ah, that was a day, already on the road, a full-fledged traveller for the family firm, equipped with an order book, a scented handkerchief, not for show only, his case of bright trinket wear, alas, a thing now of the past, and a quiverful of compliant smiles for this or that half-one housewife, reckoning it out upon her fingertips, or for a budding virgin, shyly acknowledging. But the heart, tell me, is studied Baysmoins. The scent, the smile, but more than these, the dark eyes and oligenious address brought home at duskfall many a commission to the head of the firm, seated with Jacob's pipe after like labors in the paternal ingle. A meal of noodles, you may be sure, is a heating. 
reading through round horn spectacles some paper from the Europe of a month before. But hey, presto, the mirror is breathed on, and the young knight errant recedes, shrivels, dwindles to a tiny speck within the mist. Now he is himself paternal, and these about him might be his sons. Who can say? The wise father knows his own child. He thinks of a drizzling night in Hatch Street, hard by the bonded shores there, the first. Together, she a poor waif, a child of shame, yours and mine, and of all for a bare shilling and her luck penny. Together they hear the heavy tread of the watch as two rain-caped shadows pass the new royal university. Bridie! Bridie Kelly! He will never forget the name, ever remember the night, the first night, the bride night. They are entwined in nethermost darkness, the willer with the willed, and in an instant, fiat, light shall flood the world. Did heart leap to heart? Nay, fair reader. In a breath t'was done, but hold, back, it must not be. In terror the poor girl flees away through the murk. She is the bride of darkness, a daughter of night. She dare not bear the sunny golden babe of day. No, Leopold, name and memory solace thee not. That youthful illusion of thy strength was taken from thee, and in vain. No son of thy loins is by thee. There is none now to be for Leopold what Leopold was for Rudolph. The voices blend and fuse in clouded silence silence that is the infinite of space and swiftly silently the soul is wafted over regions of cycles of generations that have lived a region where gray twilight ever descends never falls on wide sage-green pasture fields shedding her dusk scattering a perennial dew of stars she follows her mother with ungainly steps a mare leading her fillyful twilight phantoms are they yet moulded in prophetic grace of structure slim shapely haunches a supple tendinous neck the meek apprehensive skull they fade sad phantoms all is gone agendath is a wasteland a home of screech owls and the sand-blind upupa netaim the golden is no more and on the highway of the clouds they come muttering thunder of rebellion the ghosts of beasts ho hark ho parallax stalks behind and goads them the lancinating lightnings of whose brow are scorpions. Elk and yak, the bulls of Bashan and of Babylon, mammoth and mastodon, they come trooping to the sunken sea, lacus mortis. Ominous, revengeful, zodiacal host, they moan, passing upon the clouds, horned and capricorned, the trumpeted with the tusked, the lion-maned, the giant antlered, snouter and crawler, rodent, ruminant and pachyderm, all their moving, moaning multitude, murderers of the sun. Onward to the Dead Sea they tramp to drink, unslaked and with horrible gulpings, the salt, somnolent, inexhaustible flood. And the equine portent grows again, magnified in the deserted heavens, nay, to heaven's own magnitude, till it looms vast over the house of Virgo. And lo, wonder of metempsychosis, it is she, the everlasting bride, harbinger of the day-star, the bride, ever virgin. It is she, Martha, thou lost one, Millicent, the young, the dear, the radiant. How serene does she now arise, a queen among the Pleiades, in the penultimate Antilucan hour, shod in sandals of bright gold, quaffed with a veil of, what do you call it, gossamer. It floats, it flows about her starborn flesh and lucid streams, emerald, sapphire, mauve and heliotrope, sustained on currents of the cold interstellar wind, winding, coiling, simply swirling, writhing in the skies a mysterious writing till, after a myriad metamorphosis of symbol, it blazes, alpha, a ruby and triangled sign upon the forehead of Taurus. Francis was reminding Stephen of years before when they had been at school together in Conmee's time. He asked about Glaucon, Alcibiades, Pisistratus. Where were they now? Neither knew. You have spoken of the past and its phantoms, Stephen said. Why think of them? If I call them into life across the waters of Leith, will not the poor ghosts troop to my call? Who supposes it? I, Baus Stephen Ominos, bullock befriending bard, am lord and giver of their life. He encircled his gadding hair with a coronal of vine leaves, smiling at Vincent. That answer and those leaves, Vincent said to him, will adorn you more fitly when something more, and greatly more, than a cap full of light odes can call your genius father. 
All who wish you well hope this for you. All desire to see you bring forth the work you mediate, to acclaim you Stephaniforos. I heartily wish you may not fail them. Oh, no, Vincent Lenahan said, laying a hand on the shoulder near him. Have no fear. He could not leave his mother an orphan. The young man's face grew dark. All could see how hard it was for him to be reminded of his promise and of his recent loss. He would have withdrawn from the feast had not the noise of voices allayed the smart. Madden had lost five drachmas on scepter for a whim of the rider's name. Lenahan as much more. He told them of the race. The flag fell and ho! Off scamper! The mare ran out freshly with O Madden up. She was leading the field. All hearts were beating. Even Phyllis could not contain herself. She waved her scarf and cried, Huzzah! Scepter wins! But in the straight on the run home, when all were in close order, the dark horse throwaway drew level, reached, outstripped her. All was lost now. Phyllis was silent. Her eyes were sad and at Juno, she cried, I am undone. But her lover consoled her and brought her a bright casket of gold in which lay some oval sugar plums which she partook. A tear fell, one only. A whacking fine whip, said Lenahan, is W. Lane. Four winners yesterday and three today. What rider is like him? Mount him on the camel or the boisterous buffalo. The victory in a hack canter is still his. But let us bear it as was the ancient wont. Mercy on the luckless. Poor scepter, he said with a light sigh. She is not the filly that she was. Never by this hand shall we behold such another. By gad, sir, a queen of them. Do you remember her, Vincent? I wish you could have seen my queen today, Vincent said. How young she was and radiant. La Lodge were scarce fair beside her, in her yellow shoes and frock of muslin. I do not know the right name of it. The chestnuts that shaded us were in bloom, the air drooped with their persuasive odor and with pollen floating by us. In the sunny patches one might easily have cooked on a stone a batch of those buns with Corinth fruit in them that Paralipomenes sells in his booth near the bridge. But she had naught for her teeth but the arm with which I held her, and in that she nibbled mischievously when I pressed too close. A week ago she lay ill, four days on the couch, but today she was free, blithe, mocked at peril. She is more taking, then. Her posy's tool, mad romp that she is, she had pulled her fill as we reclined together. And in your ear, my friend, you will not think who met us as we left the field. Con me himself. He was walking by the hedge, reading. I think a brevier book with, I doubt not, a witty letter in it from Glycera or Chloe to keep the page. The sweet creature turned all colors in her confusion, feigning to reprove a slight disorder in her dress. A slip of underwood clung there, for the very trees adore her. When Conmi had passed, she glanced at her lovely echo in that little mirror she carries. But he had been kind, and going by he had blessed us. The gods, too, are ever kind, Lenahan said. If I had poor luck with Bass's mare, perhaps this draft of his may serve me more propensely. He was laying his hand upon a wine-jar. Malachi saw it and withheld his act, pointing to the stranger and to the scarlet label. Warily, Malachi whispered, preserve a druid silence. His soul is far away. It is as painful, perhaps, to be awakened from a vision as to be born. Any object, intensely regarded, may be a gate of access to the incorruptible eon of the gods. Do you not think it, Stephen? Theosophus told me so, Stephen answered, whom in a previous existence Egyptian priests initiated into the mysteries of karmic law. The lords of the moon, Theosophus told me, an orange fiery shipload from planet Alpha of the lunar chain would not assume the etheric doubles, and these were therefore incarnated by the ruby-colored egos from the second constellation. However, as a matter of fact, though, the preposterous surmise about him being in some description of a doldrums or other, or mesmerized, which was entirely due to a misconception of the shallowest character, was not the case at all. The individual whose visual organs, while the above was going on, were at this juncture commencing to exhibit symptoms of animation, was an astute, if not astuter than any man living, and anybody that conjectured the contrary, would have found themselves pretty speedily in the wrong shop. During the past four minutes, or thereabouts, he had been staring hard at a certain amount of number one bass bottled by Messrs. Bass & Co. at Burton-on-Trent, which happened to be situated amongst a lot of others, right opposite to where he was, and which was certainly calculated to attract anyone's remark on account of its scarlet appearance. He was simply and solely, as it subsequently transpired for reasons best known to himself, which put quite an altogether different complexion on the proceedings, after the moment before his observations about boyhood days and the turf, 
re recollecting two or three private transactions of his own, which the other two were as mutually innocent of as the babe unborn. Eventually, however, both their eyes met, and as soon as it began to dawn on him that the other was endeavouring to help himself to the thing he involuntarily determined to help him himself, and so he accordingly took hold of the neck of the medium-sized glass recipient which contained the fluid sought after, and made a capacious hole in it by pouring a lot of it out with, also at the same time, however, a considerable degree of attentiveness in order not to upset any of the beer that was in it about the place. The debate which ensued was in its scope and progress an epitome of the course of life. Neither place nor council was lacking in dignity. The debaters were the keenest in the land, the theme they were engaged on the loftiest and most vital. The high hall of Horn's house had never beheld an assembly so representative and so varied, nor had the old rafters of that establishment ever listened to a language so encyclopedic. A gallant scene, in truth, it made. Crothers was there at the foot of the table in a striking highland garb, his face glowing from the briny airs of the mull of Galloway. There, too, opposite to him, was Lynch, whose countenance bore already the stigmata of early depravity and premature wisdom. Next the Scotchman was the place assigned to Costello, the eccentric, while at his side was seated in stolid repose the squat form of Madden. The chair of the resident, indeed, stood vacant before the hearth, but on either flank of it the figure of Bannon's and Explorer's kit of tweed shorts and salted cowhide brogues contrasted sharply with the primrose elegance and town-bred manners of Malachi Roland St. John Mulligan. Lastly, at the head of the board was the young poet, who found a refuge from his labors of pedagogy and metaphysical inquisition in the convivial atmosphere of Socratic discussion, while to right and left of him were accommodated the flippant prognosticator, fresh from the hippodrome, and that vigilant wanderer, soiled by the dust of travel and combat, and stained by the mire of an indelible dishonor, but from whose steadfast and constant heart no lure or peril or threat or degradation could ever efface the image of that voluptuous loveliness which the inspired pencil of Lafayette has limned for ages yet to come. It had better be stated here and now, at the outset, that the perverted transcendentalism to which Mr. S. Dedalus's give sep contentions would appear to prove him pretty badly addicted runs directly counter to accepted scientific methods science it cannot be too often repeated deals with tangible phenomena the man of science like the man in the street has to face hard-headed facts that cannot be blinked and explain them as best he can there may be it is true some questions which science cannot answer at present such as the first problem submitted by mr l bloom pub can regarding the future determination of sex. Must we accept the view of Empedocles of Trinacria that the right ovary, the postmenstrual period, assert others, is responsible for the birth of males, or are the two long-neglected spermatozoa or nemosperms the differentiating factors, or is it, as most embryologists incline to opine, such as Culpepper, Spallanzani, Blumenbach, Lusk, Hertwig, Leopold, and Valenti, a mixture of both? This would be tantamount to cooperation, one of nature's favorite devices, between the nisus formativus of the nemosperm on the one hand, and on the other a happily chosen position, succubitus felix, of the passive element. The other problem raised by the same inquirer is scarcely less vital, infant mortality. It is interesting because, as he pertinently remarks, we are all born in the same way, but we all die in different ways. Mr. M. Mulligan, Hyge at huge dock, blames the sanitary conditions in which our grey-lunged citizens contract adenoids, pulmonary complaints, etc., by inhaling the bacteria which lurk in dust. These factors, he alleged, and the revolting spectacles offered by our streets, hideous publicity posters, re religious ministers of all denominations, mutilated soldiers and sailors, exposed scorbutic car drivers, the suspended carcasses of dead animals, paranoic bachelors, and unfructified duenas, these, he said, were countable for any and every falling off in the caliber of the race. Calipedia, he prophesied, would soon be generally adopted, and all the graces of life, genuinely good music, agreeable literature, light philosophy, instructive pictures, plaster-cast reproductions of the classical statues such as Venus and Apollo, artistic colored photographs of prize babies, all these little attentions would enable ladies who were in a particular condition to pass the intervening months in a most enjoyable manner. Mr. J. Crothers, disc back, attributes some of these demises to abdominal trauma in the case of women workers subjected to heavy labors in the workshop, 
and to marital discipline in the home, but by far the vast majority to neglect, private or official, culminating in the exposure of newborn infants, the practice of criminal abortion, or in the atrocious crime of infanticide. Although the former, we are thinking of neglect, is undoubtedly only too true, the case he cites of nurses forgetting to count the sponges in the peritoneal cavity is too rare to be normative. In fact, when one comes to look into it, the wonder is that so many pregnancies and deliveries go off so well as they do, all things considered, and in spite of our human shortcomings, which often balk nature in her intentions. An ingenious suggestion is that thrown out by Mr. V. Lynch, back a rib that both natality and mortality, as well as all other phenomena of evolution, tidal movements, lunar phases, blood temperatures, diseases in general, everything, in fine, in nature's vast workshop from the extinction of some remote sun to the blossoming of one of the countless flowers which beautify our public parks, is subject to a law of numeration as yet unascertained. Still, the plain straightforward question why a child of normally healthy parents, and seemingly a healthy child, and properly looked after, succumbs unaccountably in early childhood, though other children of the same marriage do not, must certainly, in the poet's words, give us pause. Nature, may we rest assured, has her own good and cogent reasons for whatever she does, and in all probability such deaths are due to some law of anticipation, by which organisms in which morbus germs have taken up their residence, modern science has conclusively shown that only the plasmic substance can be said to be immortal, tend to disappear at an increasingly earlier stage of development, an arrangement which, though productive of pain to some of our feelings, notably the maternal, is nevertheless, some of us think, in the long run beneficial to the race in general in securing thereby the survival of the fittest. Mr. S. Dedalus, Div. Sep, remark, or should it be called an interruption, that an omnivorous being which can masticate, deglute, digest, and apparently pass through the ordinary channel with pluto-perfect imperturbability, such multiferous elements as cancrenous females emaciated by parturition, corpulent professional gentlemen, not to speak of jaundiced politicians and chlorotic nuns, might possibly find gastric relief in an innocent collation of staggering bob, reveals as naught else could, and in a very unsavory light, the tendency above alluded to. For the enlightenment of those who are not so intimately acquainted with the minutiae of the municipal abattoir as this morbid-minded esthete, an embryo philosopher, who for all his overweening bumptiousness in things scientific can scarcely distinguish an acid from an alkali, prides himself on being, it should perhaps be stated that staggering Bob in the vile parlance of our lower class, licensed victuallers signifies the cookable and eatable flesh of a calf newly dropped from its mother. In a recent public controversy with Mr. L. Bloom, pub can, which took place in the Commons Hall of the National Maternity Hospital, 29, 30, and 31 Hollis Street, of which, as is well known, Dr. A. Horn, Lysin Midwif, FKQ, CPI, is the able and popular master. He is reported by eyewitnesses as having stated that once a woman has let the cat into the bag, an esthete's allusion, presumably, to one of the most complicated and marvelous of all nature's processes, the act of sexual congress. She must let it out again, or give it life, as he phrased it, to save her own. At the risk of her own was the telling rejoinder of his interlocutor, none the less effective for the moderate and measured tone in which it was delivered. Meanwhile, the skill and patience of the physician had brought about a happy accouchement. It had been a weary, weary while for both the patient and doctor. All that surgical skill could do was done, and the brave woman had manfully helped. She had. She had fought the good fight, and now she was very, very happy. Those who have passed on, who have gone before, are happy too, as they gaze down and smile upon the touching scene. Reverently look at her as she reclines there with the mother light in her eyes, that longing hunger for baby fingers, a pretty sight it is to see, in the first bloom of her new motherhood, breathing a silent prayer of thanksgiving to one above, the universal husband. And as her loving eyes behold her babe, she wishes only one blessing more, to have her dear Doty with her to share her joy, to lay in his arms that might of God's clay, the fruit of their lawful embraces. He is older now, you and I may whisper it, and a trifle stooped in the shoulders, yet in the whirligig of years a grave dignity has come to the conscientious second accountant of the Ulster Bank, College Green Branch. O oh, Doty, loved one of old, faithful life-mate now, it may never be again that far-off time of the roses. With the old shake of her pretty head she recalls those days. God, how beautiful now across the mist of years! But their children are grouped in her imagination about the bedside, hers and his, 
Charlie, Mary Alice, Frederick Albert, if he had lived, Mamie, Budgie, Victoria Francis, Tom, Violet Constance Louisa, darling little Bobsey, called after our famous hero of the South African War, Lord Bobs of Waterford and Kandahar. And now this last pledge of their union, a pure foy if ever there was one, with the true pure foy nose. Young Hopeful will be christened Mortimer Edward, after the influential cousin of Mr. Purefoy in the Treasury Remembrancer's Office, Dublin Castle. And so time wags on, but Father Cronian has dealt lightly here. No, let no sigh break from that bosom, dear gentle Mina. And Doty, knock the ashes from your pipe, the seasoned briar you still fancy when the curfew rings for you. May it be the distant day and doubt the light whereby you read in the sacred book, for the oil too has run low, and so with a tranquil heart to bed, to rest. He knows, and will call in his own good time. You too have fought the good fight, and played loyally your man's part. Sir, to you my hand. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. There are sins, or, let us call them as the world calls them, evil memories, which are hidden away by man in the darkest places of the heart, but they abide there and wait. He may suffer their memory to grow dim. Let them be as though they had not been, and all but persuade himself that they were not, or at least were otherwise. Yet a chance word will call them forth suddenly, and they will rise up to confront him in the most various circumstances, a vision or a dream, or while timbrel and harp soothe his senses, or amid the cool silver tranquility of the evening, or at the feast, at midnight, when he is now filled with wine. Not to insult over him will the vision come, as over one that lies under her wrath not for vengeance to cut him off from the living, but shrouded in the piteous vesture of the past, silent, remote, reproachful. That stranger still regarded on the face before him a slow recession of that false calm there, imposed, as it seemed, by habit or some studied trick, upon words so embittered as to accuse in their speaker an unhealthiness, a flair, for the cruder things of life. A scene disengages itself in the observer's memory, evoked, it would seem, by a word of so natural a homeliness as if those days were really present there, as some thought, with their immediate pleasures. A shaven space of lawn one soft May evening, the well-remembered grove of lilacs at Roundtown, purple and white, fragrant slender spectators of the game, but with much real interest in the pellets as they run slowly forward over the sward, or collide and stop, one by its fellow, with a brief alert shock. And yonder about that gray urn where the water moves at times in thoughtful irrigation, you saw another as fragrant sisterhood, flowy, eddy, tiny, and their darker friend, with I know not what of arresting in her pose then, our Lady of the Cherries, a comely brace of them pendant from an ear, bringing out the foreign warmth of the skin so daintily against the cool, ardent fruit. A lad of four or five in linsey woolsey blossom time, but there will be cheer in the kindly hearth when ere long the bowls are gathered and hutched is standing on the urn secured by that circle of girlish fond hands. He frowns a little, just as this young man does now, with a perhaps too conscious enjoyment of the danger, but must needs glance at whilst towards where his mother watches from the piazzetta, giving upon the flower close with a faint shadow of remoteness, or of reproach, alles verganguichen, in her glad look. Mark this, father, and remember, the end comes suddenly. Enter that antechamber of birth where the studious are assembled and note their faces. Nothing, as it seems, there of rash or violent. Quietude of custody, rather, befitting their station in that house, the vigilant watch of shepherds and of angels about a crib in Bethlehem of Judah long ago. But as before, the lightning, the serried storm clouds, heavy with preponderant excess of moisture, in swollen masses, turgidly distended, compass earth and sky in one vast slumber, impending above parched field and drowsy oxen and blighted growth of shrub and verdure, till in an instant the flash rives their centers and with the reverberation of the thunder the cloudburst pours its torrent. So and not otherwise was the transformation, violent and instantaneous, upon the utterance of the word. Burks outflings my lord Stephen, giving the cry, and a tag and bobtail of them all after, cockerel, jackanapes, welsher, pill-doctor, punctual bloom at heels with a universal grabbing at headgear, ash-plants, bilbos, panama hats and scabbards, zermet alpenstocks and what not. A dedal of lusty youth, noble every student there. Nurse Callan takes aback in the hallway, cannot stay them, nor smiling surgeon coming downstairs with the news of placentation ended, a full pound if a milligram. They hark him on. The door, is it open? Ha! They are out, tumultuously, off for a minute's race, all bravely legging it, 
Burks of Denzil and Hollis, their ulterior goal. Dixon follows, giving them sharp language, but raps out an oath, he too, and on. Bloom stays with nurse a thought to send a kind word to happy mother and nursling up there. Dr. Diet and Dr. Quiet. Looks she too not other now? Ward of watching in Horn's house has told its tale in that washed-out pallor. Then, all being gone, a glance of mother wit helping, he whispers close in going, Madam, when comes the stork bird for thee? The air without is impregnated with rain-dew moisture, life essence celestial, glistening on Dublin stone there under star-shiny coelum. God's air, the All-Father's air, scintillant circumnambient sessile air, breathe it deep into thee. By heaven, Theodore Purefoy, thou hast done a doughty deed and no botch. Thou art, I vow, the remarkablest progenitor barring none in this chaffering, all-including, most foriginous chronicle. Astounding! In her lay a God-framed, God-given, preformed possibility which thou hast fructified with thy modicum of man's work. Cleave to her, serve, toil on, labor like a very bandog, and let scholarment and all Malthusiasts go hang. Thou art all there, daddies, Theodore, art drooping under thy load, bemoiled with butcher's bills at home and ingots, not thine, in the counting-house. Head up, for every new-begotten thou shalt gather in thy homer of ripe wheat. See, thy fleece is drenched. Dost envy Darby Dullman there with his Joan? A canting jay and rheumied curdog is all their progeny. Shaw, I tell thee, he is a mule, a dead gastropod, without vim or stamina, not worth a cracked kreutzer. Copulation without population? No, say I. Herod's slaughter of the innocents were the truer name. Vegetables, forsooth, and sterile cohabitation. Give her beefsteaks, red, raw, and bleeding. She is a hoary pandemonium of ills, enlarged glands, mumps, quinsy, bunions, hay fever, bed sores, ringworm, floating kidney, derbyshire neck, warts, bilious attacks, gallstones, cold feet, varicose veins. A truce to threens and trentals and jeremies and all such congenital defunctive music. Twenty years of it regret them not. With thee it was not as with many that will and would and wait and never do. Thou sawst thy America, thy life task, and didst charge to cover the transpontine bison. How saith Zarathustra? Deine Kutrups al melkest du, nun trinkest du die suse milch des uters. See, it displodes for thee in abundance. Drink, man, in utterful. Mother's milk, pure foy, the milk of human kin. Milk, too, of those burgeoning stars overhead rudolent in thin rain vapor. Punch milk, such as those rioters will quaff in their guzzling den. Milk of madness, the honey milk of Canaan's land. Thy cow's dug was tough, what? Ay, but her milk is hot and sweet and fattening. No dollop this, but thick, rich bonny clabber. To her, old patriarch, pap. Per dam partulam et pertundam nunc est bibindum. All off for a buster, Armstrong, hollering down the street. Bonafides. Where you slept last night? Timothy of the battered nagin. Like all ye bilio. Any brawlies or gumboots in the fambly? Where the Henry Neville sawbones and oliclo? Sora one o' me knows. Hurrah there, dicks! Forward to the ribbon counter. Where's Punch? All serene. Jay, look at the drunken minister coming out of the maternity hospital. Benedicat vos omnipotens deus pater et filius. A make, mister. The Denzil Lane boys. Hell, blast ye! Scoot! Right, O oh, Isaacs, shove em out of the bleeding limelight. Use join us, dear sir. No intrusion in life. Lo heap good man. Ali Samidis bunch. En avant, mes enfants. Fire away number one on the gun. Burks! Burks! Thence they advanced five parasangs. Slattery's mountain foot. Where's that bleeding offer? Parson Steve, apostate's creed. No, no, Mulligan, a bath there, shove ahead. Keep a watch on the clock. Chucking out time. Molly, what's on you? Ma mère, ma mariée. British beatitudes. Retemplatan digiti boom boom. Eyes have it. To be printed and bound at the Druid drum breast by two designing females. Calf covers of pissed on green. Last word in art shades. Most beautiful book come out of Ireland, my time. Silencium. Get a spurt on. Tension. Proceed to the nearest canteen and there annex liquor stores. March. Tramp, 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 the boys are. Attitudes. Parching. Beer, beef, business, Bibles, bulldogs, battleships, buggery, and bishops. Weather on the scaffold high. Beer, beef, trample the Bibles. When for Ireland, dear. Trample the tramplers. Thunderation. Keep the derned military step. We fall. Bishop's boost box. Halt. Heave to. Rugger. Scrum in. No touch kicking. Wow, my tootsies. You hurt? Most amazingly sorry. 
Query. Who's a-standing this here do? Proud possessor of a damnal. Declare misery. Bet to the ropes. Me nanty salty. Not a red at me this week gone. Yours? Need of our fathers for the ubermensch. Ditto. Five number ones. You, sir? Ginger cordial. Chase me, the cabby's coddle. Stimulate the caloric. Winding of his ticker. Stopped short never to go again when the old. Absinthe for me, savvy? Caramba! Have an eggnog or a prairie oyster. Enemy? Avuncular's got my timepiece. Ten two. Obligated awful. Don't mention it. Got a pectoral trauma, eh, Dix? Pause fact. Got bet to be a bumblebee whenever he was set and sleep in an esbit garden. Digs up near the mater. Buckled he is. Know his dona? Yep, certain I do. Full of a dur. Seer in her dishy billy. Peels off a credit. Lovey lovekin. None of your lean kind, not much. Pull down the blind, love. Two artelons. And same here. Look slippery. If you fall, don't wait to get up. Five, seven, nine. Fine. Got a prime pair of mince pies. No kid. And her take me to rests in her anchor of rum. Must be seen to be believed. Your starving eyes and all the plastered neck, you stole my heart, O oh glue pot. Sir? Spud against the rheumatiz? All oh, poppycock, you'll excuse me saying, for the hoy polloi. I veer thee beast a gert wool. Well, doc, back for Lapland? Your corporosity sagatiating okay? How's the squaws and papooses? Woman body after going on the straw? Stand and deliver. Password. There's hair. Ours the white death and the ruddy birth. Hi, spit in your own eye, boss. Mummer's wire. Cribbed out of Meredith. Jessified, orchidized, polysimical Jesuit. Auntie Mine's writing Pa Kinch. Batty bad Stephen led astray goody good Malachi. Hurroo! Collar the leather, young un. Rune with a nappy. Here, Jock Broy Highland mends your barley brie. Lang may your lum reek and your kale pot boil. My tipple? Merci. Here's to us. How's that? Leg before wicket? Don't stain my brand new sittinums. Gives a shake of pepper, you there. Catch a holt. Caraway seed to carry away. Twig? Shrieks of silence. Every cove to his gentry mort. Venus Pandemos. Le petit femme. Bold bad girl from the town of Mullingar. Tell her I was axing at her. Hotting Sarah, by the wame. On the road to Malahide. Me? If she who seduced me had left but the name. What do you want for ninepence? Makri, Makruskin. Smutty mole for a mattress jig. And a pull all together. X. Waiting, governor? Most deciduously. Bet your boots on. Stunned like, seeing as how no shiners is a-coming. Under constumble? He've got us the chink, ad-lib. Seed near free poon on un spell ago, us said warizen. Us come right in on your invite, see? Up to you, matey. Out with the oof. Two bar and a wing. You larn that go off of they there Frenchy bilks. Won't wash here for nuts, no how. Little child velly solly. Is it a cutest color coon down our side? God's to Ruth, Charlie. We are nay foul. We're nay tha foul. Au reservoir, Masu. Thanks you. Tis, sure, what say? In the speakeasy. Tight. I she you, sure. Bannum, two days tea tea. Bowsing not but claret wine. Garn, have a glint, do. Come, I'm jiggered. And been to barber he have, too full for words, with a railway bloke. How come you so? Opera he'd like? Rose of Castile. Rose of Cast. Police! Some H2O for a gent fainted. Look at Bannum's flowers. Gemini. He's gonna holler. The Colleen Bon. The Colleen Bon. Oh, cheese it. Shut his blurry Dutch oven with a firm hand. Had the winner today till I tipped him a dead cert. The rough incline the nab of Stephen hand as give me the jady coppoline. He strike a telegram boy, battock wire, big bug bass to the depot. Shove him a joey and cram eyes. Mare on form, hot order. Guinea to a goose gog. Tell a cram that. Gospel true. Criminal diversion? I think that, yes. Sure thing. Land him in choky choky if the Harmon Beck cop the game. Madden back? Madden's a maddening back. Oh, uh, lust our refuge and our strength. Decamping. Must you go? Off to Mammy. Stand by. Hide my blushes, someone. All in if he spots me. Come a home, our bantam. Harivar, mong view. Dinner forgot the cowslips for herself. Corn fied. What give you thon colt? Pal to pal. Janak. Of John Thomas, her spouse. No fake, old man Leo. Selt me, honest injun. Shiver my timbers if I had. There's a great big holy friar. Vy for you no me tell. Vel, I says, if that ain't a sheeny notches, vel, I will get mishna mishina. Though yerd our lord, amen. You move a motion? Steve boy, you're going at some. More bluggy drunkables? 
will immensely splendiferous stander permit one studer of most extreme poverty and one large size grandacious thirst to terminate one expensive inaugurated libation? Gives a breather. Landlord, landlord, have you good wine, Stebu? Hoots, man, a wee drop to pre. Cut and come again. Right. Boniface, absinthe the lot. Nos omnes bibiriamus viridum toxicum diabolus capiat posteriora nostria. Closing time, gents. Eh? Rome boost for the bloom toff. I hear you say onions? Blue? Cadges adds. Photos poply by all that's gorgeous. Play low, partner. Slide. Bonsoir, la compagnie. And snares of the pox fiend. Where's the buck and Namby Amby? Skunked? Leg bail. Ah, weel. Ye mon e'en gang your gates. Checkmate. King to tower. Kind Christiane, will you help young man whose friend took bungalow key to find place where to lay crown of his head tonight? Crikey, I'm about sprung. Tarnally doggone my shins if this beant the bestest puttiest long break yet. Item, curate, couple of cookies for this child. Cots plud and prandy pals, none. Not a pite of sheeses? Thrust syphilis down to hell and with him those other licensed spirits. Time, gents, who wander through the world. Health all, a la votre. Golly, wot and tunk it's yon guy in the Macintosh. Dusty roads. Peep at his wearables. By mighty, what's he got? Jubilee mutton. Bovril by James wants it real bad. Do you can bear socks? Seedy cuss in the Richmond? Rather. Thought he had a deposit of lead in his penis. Trumpery insanity. Bartle the bread, we calls him. That, sir, was once a prosperous sit. Man all tattered and torn that married a maiden all forlorn. Slung her hook, she did. Here see lost love. Walking Macintosh of Lonely Canyon. Tuck and turn in. Schedule time. Nix for the hornies. Pardon? Seen him today at Arunafal? Chum a yarn passed in his checks? Lud a massy. Poor pickaninnies. There'll no be telling me that, pulled veg. Did him's blubble big splash cry tears cause friend Padney was took off in black bag? Of all de darkies, Massa Pat was vera best. I never see the like since I was born. Tiens, tiens, but it is well sad that, my faith, yes. Oh, get rev on a gradient one in nine. Live axle drives are souped. Lay you two to one, Janatsi licks him ruddy well hollow. Jappies? High angle fire in ya, sunk by war specials. Be worse for him, says he, nor any Russian. Time all, there's eleven of them. Get you gone. Forward, woozy wobblers. Night, night. May Allah, the excellent one, your soul this night ever tremendously conserve. Your attention, were nay that foul, the leith police dismisseth us. The least the lease. Wear hawks for the chap puking, unwell in his own abominable regions. Blugh, night. Mona, my true love. Blugh, Mona, my own love. Ugh. Hark, shut your obstropolis. <laughs> Blaze on. There she goes. Brigade, bout ship. Mount Streetway, cut up. <laughs> Tally ho, you not come? Run, Skelter, race. <laughs> Lynch, hey, sign on long o' me. Denzel Lane this way. Change here for the body house. We too, she said, will seek the kips where Shady Mary is. Right, oh, any old time. Late habuntur in cubilibus suis. You coming long? Whisper, who the sooty hell's the Johnny and the black duds? Hush! Sinned against the light, and even now the day is at hand when he shall come to judge the world by fire. <laughs> Ut implorentur scripturae. Strike up a ballad. Then out spake medical Dick to his comrade medical Davy. Christical, who's this excrement yellow gospeler on the Marian Hall? Elijah is coming, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Come on, you wine-fizzling, gin-sizzling, boost-guzzling existences. Come on, you doggone, bull-necked, beetle-browed, hog-jowled, peanut-brained, weasel-eyed four-flushers, false alarms, and excess baggage. Come on, you triple extract of infamy. Alexander J. Christ Dowie, that's my name, that's yanked to glory most half this planet from Frisco Beach to Vladivostok. The deity ain't no nickel-dime bum show. I put it to you that he's on the square in a corking fine business proposition. He's the grandest thing yet, and don't you forget it. Shout salvation in King Jesus! You'll need to rise press early, you sinner there, if you want to diddle the almighty God. <laughs> Not half. He's got a cough mixture with a punch in it for you, my friend, in his back pocket. Just you try it on. End of chapter 14